Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing. And the tour of Northern Ireland continues, and we're delighted to be joined by the man of five, oh. Philip McCallan. So we've got. Uh, we were just looking at your records there before. Um, fifth in the all-time uh, TT leaderboard in terms of victories, with eleven victories, five TTs in one Northwest, five TT, five TTs in a single day at the Ulster. And um, is that have North I got, North I'll, 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 I'll help go. you? I'll help you. Okay, <laughs> just so you get it right. Go on, man. Uh, it was five Northwest in one day, which is a uh, obviously a, a record you know and it was hard to do believe it or not 1992 i should have had six six but i fell off in the 250 race while fighting for the lead and that brought me back to five so only for that i possibly could have had six and that day why i wanted six which no one was ever going to get really there was a car there was a free car for anyone who could win six races wow. the car thought it was safe you know and uh it came was pretty close well, until well, I fell well, off. Well, my first question is, what car was it? <laughs> Can you remember? I, I do, and I won't tell you because it, it was a bit of a lousy car. That <laughs> really, oh, God. And, uh, as, as well as, as it, well it as... was a car that I wouldn't really have wanted. But like right. anything free and anything is brilliant. Of course, you'll take it. But yeah. you know, we knew the car was up. And uh, it was a bit of a joke to every rider there, obviously, Northwest to win, <laughs> you know, one race. To win one race at Northwest is unbelievable, but to get five was brilliant. Unbelievable. And also, um, up until Hutchie broke your record as well at the TT, it was. <laughs> let's, let's not talk about Hutchie. Let's <laughs> <laughs> talk about Peter Hickman. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah, let's yeah. get them all out there. Yeah, uh, is it, am I right in saying four in a, in a single week at the TT? Yeah, four Jesus. in a week. So it was quite good, really. Uh, my dream, I might as well tell you. So uh, five Northwest in one day, is, that's it. You can't do any more. Five Ulster Grand Prix in one day, again, you can't do any more. Even Hutchie didn't do more. he done seven, but he'd done it over two days. i done my five in one day. So both him and I have got five wins each in one day at the Ulster Grand Prix, you Jesus. know. But he hasn't got five wins at the Northwest and he never will, you know. <laughs> he never will. He never, and, uh, never will. Um, I bet that would have been a, a, a decent old payday, five in a five in a day. I bet you were, uh, I bet the beers were on you that night in that. In, yeah, in I had, not only had to buy the beer, I had to buy the food also for about a week afterwards, you know. I bet. And uh, <laughs> the rest of that story is four TTs in a week. So really back in them days, so I'd won five Ulster Grand Prix in the day, five Northwest in the day, and my dream, which was close so many times, to win five TTs in a week. And if I could have won five TTs in a week, I just would have stood up on Friday. This was 96, 97. I would have stood up on Friday and said, that's it. It's all really? over. Yeah. Because I was never going to race and until I had a fatality I just wanted I raced bikes because I loved racing bikes and of course I wanted to win and I loved road racing but I wasn't going to race forever because really you know the odds get against you the older you get the more often you do it an accident could happen it's quite a dangerous sport as we know mm -hmm. so uh, an accident could happen you know so if you're going to keep playing the same ball you might get an accident someday but so I never wanted to do that I just wanted to win five TTs in a week just hang up my ladders mm -hmm and go back to engineering or whatever I wanted to do, you know? God so, uh, but it never happened. I'll tell you what, to all our listeners, if you're thinking they've missed the whole beginning of the podcast, haven't they? They've, we've got yeah, straight, we haven't even straight started yet. That's it, that's what no. I'm saying. What, 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 got, <laughs> what got the man, the main man himself, Philip, in the motorcycles to begin with? Well, I've always, from as a kid, uh, I always loved bicycles, you know. Were you born just outside Tanrigay Road Race Circuit? Yeah, yeah, that's right. my home track. You know, my, my mum's house, uh, which is still there, is like, one mile from Marley Coo Corner. You oh, know. right, aye. So, yeah, that was it. But really, when I was a kid, um, you know, I loved bicycles. I was bicycle. I raced push bikes from when I was 11 years old till I was 16, until I got my, you know, first 50cc AP50. When you said uh, push bikes, as in like road cycles. Yeah, road bikes, road bikes, yeah. Road racing mm -hmm. uh, and stuff, you know. And I was, actually, I was quite good, you know. I was... <laughs> And I loved it, so I did. But the day and hour I got my license and I got my 50cc bike, I just sold all my push bikes, you know. Just straight away. Straight away. Because I remember what a feeling to do this here, to turn a throttle 
I always wanted to go faster. You're bikers, right? You just want to go fast, don't you? You want to go fast. And uh, I wanted to go faster. But the trouble with a bicycle is you have to paddle to go faster. <laughs> well, do, do you know in terms of when you when you um, go through your career and you always have them step ups and you would usually, you would go from like say a 50 to like your first gearbox bike and then you go from like say a 65 or whatever up to 125 and then up to a 250 or 600 and then up to a thousand. Every time you step up, it's always like an unbelievable thrill because of the, the difference. But nothing ever beats going from pedaling to your first first <laughs> bike where you just twist the throttle because that the difference is just like yeah you're, you're not, not tired yeah it's almost it's just like a new world in it and no. uh, it's um what, what's been do you know out of all the bikes you've stepped up onto what's been like your biggest like pff, moment. Jesus, oh, been, come come on. I'll tell you what, gonna have to go. I tell you what, nah. what's been yours. <sighs> My biggest one probably was on a 750 when I ne I'd never, you know, my first ever real race on a 750 was the TT in 1989, right? TT. No prior testing or anything? Wait, oh, you did it? Wait. No, not really. I had yeah. a, earlier on in 1988, uh, I had a, a guy called Winston McAdoo. You'll know oh, yes, yeah, so McAdoo racing. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. Winston was the first man ever to give me a ride on a 750, an RC30 Honda 750. Oh, beautiful. So he was, and uh, Winston and I actually, we'd been so close over the years of working together because I respect Winston as a very, very good sponsor. And I think he respected me as a up and coming young hooligan who could <laughs> win races. And uh, <laughs> we were close to getting to working together a few times, and but it just didn't happen for different reasons. And uh, But he was the first man to give me a ride on a 750 or C30. And then, and, uh, so I'd only raced, and also, you know, I've, sort of lots of regrets in my life really now but at the time there weren't regrets you know another bike that I was offered to ride was the famous Johnny Ray 750 Yamaha you know that TZ 750 that lots of people rode well Johnny I was very very friend there now we're talking about old Johnny Ray who's Johnny Ray's granddad aye his dad, dad. and um, so he offered me that bike to ride in 1988 but I was always very very good friends with him as a friend and another good friend of his <coughs> was a sponsor called Joe Miller if you remember Joe Miller you boys might be too young to remember him but I've heard the name Joe Miller uh, run Eddie Laycock in the Grand Prix yes he run Mike Williams in the Grand Prix uh, I think did Rutter even do a couple of Grand Prix with him maybe or something you know uh, some of the Laverty boys ran with him as well, you know. So Joe Miller was a great, great sponsor and a big man, but he was best mates. He was him and Johnny Ray was good friends, and you know I was good, had a good relationship with them. But anyway, he he didn't beg me, but he wanted me for, to ride his bike, hmm. and I said, Johnny, I'm not good enough to ride your bike, you know. And he goes, I goes, no, it's too big and too fast. I couldn't ride. I couldn't do you justice on that bike, and he goes, no, you could, you could, and. But I didn't take it, you know, but then other people got on that bike and some done good and some didn't. So I thought, often thought I should have rode that bike. Who, who got on the bike after you turned uh, it down then? I can't remember really, but that Mark Farmer rode it for a bit. Hmm. Uh, Is that Keith Farmer's uncle? Yes, it would be, yes. You boys, you're young. You don't remember all these people there. We went to school together, Mark Farmer and I, you know. Um, obviously, young Johnny rode it. Uh, Michael Swan, you wouldn't remember Michael Swan, young Swan's dad yeah, now, yeah. who's racing, right? Scott Swan's dad, I. Yeah, he rode it as well. Uh, there was quite a few people had a ride on it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and you were in the same race at this point against his yeah, bike. Yeah, but I thought, no, that's too fast for me. It's too big, and I, I didn't take it. I was only riding 250s and 350s then. Right. So so really then we get back to the original question. We, we drift a bit, don't we, like here, because we are racers and we remember other things. But so anyway... It was 1989, then I took a, a factory Kawasaki ride. I was actually offered a factory Honda ride in 1988 at the Manx Grand Prix. I won that, destroyed the lap records by about 10 miles an hour in the newcomers and in the 250 race. Can you remember what, what it was beforehand and then what you broke it to, like roughly? I remember exactly. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I don't really remember, right? Hold on, hold on, boys. There's another problem, right? We'll, we'll forget about that phone call. Uh, so modest, I love it. I'm not really that bad, I promise. Oh, good uh, man, good man. I think it was around like 100 miles an hour or something. In uh, 88, in did you 88, say? yeah. Jesus. For the 250 one. And I think I put that to about 107 or 108 mile an hour. 
which was to break a lap record by seven or eight miles That's an hour was huge yeah was mental wasn't it? Um, you know, by the way we've, we've been running our stock down in the fridge and uh so we've got on the phone to alan here we're obviously over in northern ireland next day delivery on amazon and he's filled our fridge back up so would you like would you like a drink with, oh i'd love one would you uh, we've got rich energy th- sugar free or sugar or water uh, obviously it would have to be sugar free sugar you know, free that's what yeah, i'm yeah, looking for as well watch the figure he's, he's, he's making a 250 yeah come back he's gonna go smash another lap record good lad but, good um, lad <laughs> no I, I love 250s and um really probably another big mistake but we better watch here we're drifting too much you know so let's get back where, where drift, like, where drift like. all you want um, on this show don't you worry about it <sighs> all that. together now then that boys cheers, <laughs> cheers. 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 Thank Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> open that because you can't drink it if you don't open that <laughs> come on chrissy mm. how are you <laughs> and, um, so anyway up to that point i had just raced 250s and 350s and uh bob mcmillan and honda you boys remember Bob, or you're, mm-hmm. you've heard of him. You don't yeah. probably remember, but you've heard of him. So anyway, Bob was the boss of Honda Racing, and he was at the Manx Grand Prix when I won that stuff. And obviously anyone who can bust a lap record by seven or eight mile an hour must be good, you know. Yeah, get the pen and paper out. Yeah, here, yeah. so we had a deal that I would have Hondas for 1989. In the meantime, I was talking to Kawasaki. And Kawasaki, that time was run by Alec Wright. You might remember them and, yeah. Col- and Colin Wright. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Colin's dad. So, uh, and um, Kawasaki UK. So they wanted to be Kawasaki. At that time, they had, um, I'm trying to think of the riders they had. Right. I'm getting old, my memory's gone, but they had some good riders. Uh, I'll tell you one story about this. At that time, John Reynolds, do you remember the famous Kawasaki rider? He was just like an apprentice in Team Green. So he was. The the, the the main guys was, uh, what do you call it, Guy Swan and another guy. I'm stupid because I do know their names. <laughs> anyway, uh, they were there and Kawasaki wanted me to ride the bike. Well, obviously, I loved Hondas because I was racing a 250 Honda, 125s, and I'd won. And I sort of put Kawasaki to the side and took the Honda. It, it was not officially. It was, we want you to ride the bike, and that's it. And anyway, I was talking to Kawasaki, and they were giving me uh, a 250. I wasn't getting the GP 250, I was getting the KR1S. Do you remember those? I've, oh, I've I, actually got one. Have you? Mm. Right. Me and my dad have got one between us. But right. uh, Well, I had a few good results on a KR. What I had was a KR1S with the full Formula 3 kit on it. And that was like from Japan. So, proper trick. They're an, aw- they're an awesome bike, man, aren't they? Pardon? They're an awesome bike. Oh, yes, without a doubt. You know, well, we'll, get, we'll talk about that later. So, anyway. <laughs> I had a what they offered me at the, t- at, the at this time was a 250 KR1S, a, a 600 with GPZ or GPX, whichever they were, and a 750. And their first 750 just came out at that time, mm. you know. So, anyway, what happened then at the NEC show? You know, we used to go to Ali Pali back in them days, and uh, not the NEC. Ali, you know the London show there was XL, yeah, XL. Where That's well, it. Ali Pali was way before the XL, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that's where all the talking and the racing was done. And Honda Bob McMahon had to come along and say, Philip, we can't support you. And I'm going, What? You know, because by now I'm excited. I hadn't told no one, but my inner team knew, like, we're going to get Hondas for next year. He goes, Well, why not? He goes, The truth is, Philip, we don't have enough bikes. You don't have enough bikes. Well, when you go back on it, they had uh, bloody Hizzy was riding for them. Right. Carl Fogarty was riding for them. Brian Morrison was riding for them. I even think Roger Burnett was still in there then. And someone else. Uh, I think Nick Jeffries was maybe getting help. Anyway, they already had about four or five riders. Mm. And they didn't have enough bikes. So he apologised and all the rest. And sort of then I thought I didn't care. Look, I'm getting a Kawasaki ride. And I didn't know enough about Kawasaki. I did know about Kawasaki, but not in any more detail than that. So what happened, we done the deal. And uh, I got my 250 because I was a road racer. They wanted me for road race and they didn't want me for track race. And they wanted me to win Northwest and win Ulsters and win TTs. And I wanted to do that. And all the talk of the 750 was like the best bike in the world. You know, it was going to be the bike to beat everything. Yeah. So 250 KR1S, my 600 and my 750. I was going to have two 750s, a production one, and a one with all the kit in it. Aye. 
and uh, which was you're really looking forward to, but it didn't really work out. You know, I I think I can't even remember the first road race at Tandragee if I rode the seven fifty or not. I can't remember much about that. I need to check, but anyway. I had a massive crash in the Cookstown 100 was another race, but I had like, you know, 130, 140 mile an hour crash there. Which in corner was that then? Uh, I don't know if you know, you probably don't know the old Cookstown course. Oh, the proper course. The proper one, yeah. The proper one. <laughs> the much, where, much faster one. Yeah, the much faster <laughs> one. Well, you, you come up the road to Sturgetown and then you take a right and you go up over a hill and you drop down a hill. It must be, I'm going to say, a mile and a half. Right. Easy, a flat out. Right, proper build, proper momentum. stuff, proper stuff, you know. So you go over the rise and down the other side, and you're going along, and you're easy up to 100 and as fast as 600 can go, yeah. 150 miles an hour around that. And just you come through a farmyard and you drop down a hill to a right hand corner. That's okay, I'm coming there flat out. I was actually, I think Brian Reed was leading the race, and myself and Sam McLemmons. Hmm. Sam was, you've heard of Sam, he's a great, great veteran, a great big bike rider. And I was sort of the young cub chasing Sam. And uh, he was on a Honda, I was in a Kawasaki. And Kawasaki's weren't really known for winning. In the BSB, or in the old 600 Super Sport in them days, they were getting up near the front. Hmm. And, but the bikes were tuned to the neck. And my sort of one wasn't really, you know. We just couldn't get much speed out of mine with all this stuff. We didn't know enough trick things. So anyway, we're coming down to that corner flat out and Sam's in front. And I knocked my bike off, which was, you know, to knock it off the corners. And it wouldn't slow down. Just kept wound open. Yeah, the throttle was stuck wide open. Jesus. Right? I Jesus is right. You know the feeling, <laughs> don't you? Yeah. So it's 150 miles an hour. You're going down a hill on this right hand com corner coming that you must get down at least one or two gears for. <laughs> Shit, isn't it? <laughs> Just, what did you have to do? Just bail so, off. I've got the picture. I can show you it. <laughs> yeah, but I've got... <laughs> So what happened the was picture of the underpants, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was so doing. I knocked it off, and but as I before I this is unbelievable, right? Before I knocked it off, when I was going flat out, there's a marshal out, mm. right? And this is the truth. This in the pictures too. There's a marshal out with a yellow flag going mad, you know, waving this yellow flag in the middle of the road. And you know what I thought? Sam was just in front of me. I thought he's fallen off around the corner, right? So I imagine Sam's crashed. The road's blocked around the corner, and I'm flat out. No. Got, this thing won't shut off won't shut off right Jesus. shit right so I get the clutch in right I get the brake on what I can so this thing get the clutch in try to get the brake on and I'm going to have to try and make the corner you know because this thing won't slow down anymore I've no choice I've got to try it and just as I go to tip it over the thing goes sideways so it's now sliding down the road I will show you the picture right it's sliding down the road sideways like this and you can see, clutches in the picture. The photographer who took the picture, right, he was running. Now, by now, you can talk to the people. Everyone's running. This bike is coming at 150 mile an hour looking out of control. Right. But why they were out raving the flag, I didn't know. The smoke is all coming out of the back of this bike like she's exploded. So they seen this bike explode. I didn't know what happened. The con rod broke, right? And it cut right through the cases, the right hand case. And the bike was dumping oil out onto the exhaust. That's where all the smoke was coming from, right? And obviously the oil was by this time getting to the back tire. The reason the throttle was stuck flat out, a valve went into the carburetors and stuck the end. You know, the butterflies were all linked together. So a Literally valve wedged open. was wedged open, the butterflies. That's why it wouldn't shut off. <laughs> and all the smoke's coming out. So people see this crash happening long before I even know about it. <laughs> You're lucky that day. Yeah. Jesus. So, how many how, yeah. how many of those moments have you had? Like, not like those, I got away with that. <sighs> lots, moments, lots. I bet. But that's not the end of the story. Keep right. going then. So anyway, <laughs> I tip it into the corner and the bike's sliding. You know, we're confident, aren't we? I think I'm holding it. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, I've got to hold this thing because I'm going to die if I don't, mm -hmm. you know. So I tip it in, it's sliding down. I really will find the picture on my phone for you before we leave. And it's, it's a picture everywhere. Sliding flat out. And I thought, right, I'm okay. Well, of course, didn't it catch then, right? So you can imagine what... It might have slowed it down to 100 mile an hour by now, or 120, but you can imagine a 120 mile an hour high sider when it finally gripped 
So it fired me right through a hedge, down a field. The bike goes through the hedge, goes through down the field, and the poor bike's ripped to bits. You know, <laughs> that was it. I ended up, I think I had a broken foot or something. You know, nothing, nothing <laughs> After all that, just a broken foot. Yeah, which was Jeez. pretty mild, wasn't it, for very, all that? Very lucky, very lucky. And, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and we're talking about a 750, but now I haven't got riding a 750. I don't think I had it by that time. I'm not sure if I got out in the road. I can't remember riding it on a road race, but then anyway, I went to the Northwest. And by now, lots of people are saying you shouldn't be riding these bikes, Philip, because my KR1S, right, I'm trying to ride that like a, like I rode my old GP250, my Honda, and I had a few offs on it because I just was riding it off the tires. You know, it was like just uh, trying to win races. The season before, 1988, you know, I'd... Um, I didn't win the Northwest because I crashed there and broke my foot. But I had won about uh, six or seven Irish championships between road races and short circuit stuff. You know, I went to the Manx Grand Prix. I'd smashed a lap rack hard. I'd won that. I was just winning everything. You know, it was my first season where I was beating riders like Joey Dunlop, riders like Brian Reed, Robert Dunlop, Noel Hudson, Stephen Cull, all of them. You know, I was beating everyone and having lap rack hards everywhere. And now I'm going to crashing every other week and getting up. He was, do you know, at the time when you went to the Manx and um, smashed the lap record by such a large margin, if that was, if that happened in like today's world, so like <coughs> I'd say someone turned up at the Manx and if it's about 122, imagine if someone went like 125, 126, everyone would be thinking this person needs to slow, like this person's I... crazy out of control, needs to slow down, he's going to end up killing himself. That's probably what people would be thinking. But... Back then, did <laughs> were people worried about like, because you were going so much faster than what other people had went, were people not a, a bit sort of worried I, I, about you? How I, much? Think, I think they were. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, did you hear any like negatively directly? Oh yeah. I bet you did. Yeah, of course, that deck's got to be killed. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's out of control. But actually, believe it or not, you know, it might have looked like I was out of control, but I wasn't. Mm. You know, I felt a lot, I was in control of that bike, you know, because to be honest, if you look back on it, you couldn't keep doing that if you were out of control, if you didn't know what you were doing, you did, know. Did you have anyone on the sidelines at that point going, look, calm down or speed up? It's I'm just going to, I'm going to pose definitely a question to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely not speed up, 100% not that, but it's a bit like, looking, looking now, you saw Philip McCallum coming up Smashing lap records by six, seven, same age, everything <laughs> but, like that. But like a bollock chick man's doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hold on. How, how old were you at that that point then? You know, like so. Yeah. When, you know, when you came, like the hool- I love it how you, you called yourself a hooligan, the hooligan <laughs> phase. So, at what point was that? Like all the wins, all this like the, this like crashing and everything. What what age were you at this point? I was a. Uh, I started racing and. Uh, 83 mm-hmm. so I was 20 then in 1983 but then I had a big car crash I started really my dream I wanted to be a road racer and they had this hor- horrible clause in the thing like you boys know about now we had to do something like six road races six sorry you had to do six six short circuits before you could get a road race license yes I you know so I was doing short circuits just to get my road race license because I wasn't interested in going. I called it round and round circles. You know, it's like was it? You so know. there was literally no interest from the day from day dot. There was no interest in short circuit like British BSB equivalent. No, not really. Because when I was a kid, you see, Joey Dunlop was every if you were a really started it goes way beyond that because you see, I used to from I was I raced push bikes obviously, and I was sixteen. I got my motorbike license. Well, I was hooked after that. Just like you say, you know, to turn this throttle, you could actually go faster without paddling. It was unreal, wasn't it? You know, you could get to 50 miles an hour, and if you had your chin down, you'd get 55, you know. <laughs> and, you know, the feeling, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You've been there. And uh, so then I rid road bikes, right? So I started off, you know, my 50, then I had, a, I think, a 175 Kawasaki, and then I had my X7, and then I had something else, and then I ended up with a GS1000. You know, that's what was my, when I was, uh, I know, I actually know what age it was, I was 20. Uh, when I got my GS1000, I was 20 years old. But to be honest, I was an accident going to happen. It was going to happen. You know, it, my, my road to work every morning, you know, from my house to work was, about seven miles but 
you know, I think of them as 130 or 40. If I didn't reach 130 or 40 on certain parts of that road, you know, it wasn't a good day to work. You know, we had one right hander and like a 70, 80 mile an hour right hander. And if I didn't trail my pipe in that corner, there was something wrong. You know, so I'd be going around this corner, it had a Dunstall slimline four into one pipe on it. You boys are too young to know what that is, but you know, it's a nice little slim pipe coming out the side. So I'd be going to work land down, flat my side, looking down to see the sparks, you know, probably looking down instead of looking ahead. <laughs> and, uh, so if you didn't see any sparks, it wasn't a good morning, you know, and then we had a jump bit as well. And you had another jump at Bork's uh, uh, corner speed place. There was a jump and a left hander after it and that was a hundred mile an hour jump so you would get it up on the air and you would have to get it tilted at the right angle to finish the corner when you landed you know so it was it was great i loved it and uh, in the wet you know on that bike i'd be just hitting the clutch it's 50 60 70 miles an hour putting it sideways you know so you'd be passing three or four cars you just drop the clutch and there this bike would be passing the car <laughs> sideways in the wet you know it was like and uh, I remember in the winter racing my mates, they would be in their cars, my mates were all in cars and I was like the one on bikes, but even in the snow and in the ice, we'd be racing and I'd be slitting this thing like speedway style, you know, holding the front <laughs> wheels, you know, and uh, just, it was brilliant. I loved riding bikes, that was it. And um, so really I had to stop, you know, I knew I was smart enough to know I'm going to get hurt here. I was about to say, you was, your, was your mother aware of any of this at this oh, no. point? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, she knew you. Yeah, your like, lad, your yeah. lad's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, we did have a few of those, yeah. You know, and my uncle in the, in the local village, uh, my family owned the local, where well, we were like, we had the, the grocery shop way back in the end days, and we had the butcher's shop, we had the post office, and then we also had uh, two or three milk lorries and a grocery van. Busy family. Yeah. So Very we, busy family. So like from I was five, I was brought up to work. You know, I was delivering milk from I was five or six years old. And um, but so, yes, so in the local community, the local town, the local village, everyone knows everybody, don't they? So, of course, there we go. My father died when I was only nine. And uh, sort of so my uncle Ivan, who's my mom's brother, he would have been like the father figure. Yes. In sir. our house, you know, and uh, when Uncle Ivan spoke to you, you know, it was it was serious. <laughs> So lots of times he would take me in, he would, oh, Philip, you've been speeding again. I've heard about it. You've done this now. Do not do that. Like, okay, 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 I won't do that again. I would feel bad because I was betraying him. But like, I loved it, didn't I? I just wanted to go faster. And... Was, before your father passed away, was he into bikes? Yeah, my father had a motorbike, yeah. He just one, I believed, you know. But my father died when I was nine. He died yeah. of multiple cirrhosis. So uh, oh, right. really we had a... You know, him and I had a good relationship up to that point. And, uh, but I had two brothers. So when your dad died, you know, things changed, you know, and uh, it was just my mom left. So we sort of made an agreement between us. Like we, we won't annoy mom. Yeah. You know, we, you know. Wait, were you yeah. the youngest or the oldest? No, I, was the middle, the I was the middle. Oh, the middle one. The middle, yeah. So you, you we were stuffed. You yeah. couldn't do right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, even when I got my first 50, you see what happened was I bought that one as 15 right from the money I earned delivering milk hmm. and um bag come up for sale and I bought it but I didn't tell mom but I had a crash helmet and a coat but I had friends who was on motorbikes so I'd say when I'd come back home with the you know my crash helmet all in the house I would say I got left home with a friend but I didn't I used to park my car my bike up in the church car park and walk down the road, you know. <laughs> I wonder and, if people used to go, by God, Christ, that vicar gets over. Look at the, look at them tyres. Not a single chicken strip yeah. on them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but then I got caught. Ah. What did your mum say? <sighs> Poor mum. She just like, I felt the worst. I'd really let my mum down. Mm. So what happened anyway, I was out with my girlfriend on the back and we were coming home. And in this country for years and years, you hear people talk about roadblocks, road checks. There was checkpoints everywhere. You know, the, the army, because of all the, back in the end days, you know, people were getting shot everywhere in this country. Yeah. So there was road checkpoints everywhere. So we came to a road checkpoint. And I thought, right, I can't go through this. So I s turned the lights off, turned around, drove off the other way in the dark, didn't I? <laughs> With my girlfriend on my back, we're on, a, we're on an AP-50 and we think I'm getting away, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so <laughs> before long, yeah, come on. yeah, we've got this to you. They can't see us, but they can hear you. Yeah, but I thought I'm being smart, you know, my way, and because I was a milkman and I know all, I know all the roads, all everything off by heart everywhere. So there is no problem driving with no lights. It's dead easy. I'll still work out where I'm going, see it. So anyway, off I go. But they could come up this road and there was a choice to go right or left. You have to turn to go right, which is quite near my house now. And uh, I decided to go right. They'll think I'll go left, you know, but they didn't. I went right around the corner of the road and I could see the police land rover it was come behind me with these blue lights flashing and signs going everything, you know. <laughs> We're going to get so, shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's what they do with people like that, you know, because you, if you go from a road a checkpoint to something wrong, so I got the road a bit more and then I think, right, there's a little, another lane that loops around the back here. So I turn right into that lane, up I go. Shit, don't they turn right and follow me? I'm trying to, how do they know where I'm going? Didn't I forget, right? They told me afterwards, like, I put the brake light on, so I see my brake light when I turned. <laughs> 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 I turned the lights off, not a problem. But did I forget about the brake light? <laughs> I've been rumbled, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was afterwards. I, just, I would love to have seen your and face there. God. How have you done it? How have you done it? So anyway, then, chase me on some more. And then it comes, we go up, now it's uphill, out of the section of the lane. So it was okay, down the hill and round the corners, but on the climb, two up. You know, me and my girlfriend, this thing bzzz, up a hill. So of course, the, the catch up with me is right on behind my light signs, everything going. I'm thinking, what do I do, you know? And as we come up, the road opened up and they came up alongside me and put me into the hedge. And put me off, you know. Knocked you off? Oh, yeah, at the hedge, yeah. That's how they stopped me. There's nowhere else to go straight into the hedge because the corner was going around to the right. But the girlfriend wasn't happy. <sighs> oh, no. So, uh, and her wear good trousers on, no. <laughs> <laughs> Out of all that scenario, remember the trousers. <laughs> she got to... <laughs> so, anyway, then they jump out, we're in the hedge, and they jump out, and we just have to say, look, look, you know, I'm not a terrorist, I'm not a bad person, I've just got no license and all the stuff. So, anyway, they bring me back to the police station, me and my girlfriend, they leave her home, you know, right? No one police car, or whatever, took her home, and the other one took me home, you know. So, we walked down, pad to my house, knock the front door, you know, and mum looked out, I could see mum looking out of her bedroom window by now, it was maybe 12 o'clock or I don't know, 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. And my mum comes and opens the front door. Oh. And I'm there. This is the truth. With a police mum and me by the scruff of the neck at the front door. You know. And all I could say was, mum, I'm sorry. Mum, I'm sorry. Mum, I'm sorry. You know, because I'd really, I'd let my mum down so bad. It was unreal. Yeah. You know. And uh, I can't remember all the rest, what happened that night. But my mum was just disgusted. The police, you know. And we are supposed to be a respectable family, bringing me home. Did your brothers so, lynch you and all? You made a pact, didn't they? Like, like your brothers yeah. did lay into you. Wait, was that was... the finish with the girlfriend? Or yeah, did, yeah. You let, did you give you a free pass on it? I, 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 can, I can just imagine her in the hedge going, how's the bike? What do you mean, how's the bike? What, you... <laughs> what about me? Like, I'm just checking the bike first. Yeah, <laughs> but... yeah I, I can't even remember how the bike got back. They brought the bike back to the police station. I can't remember where a policeman drove that or... I can't remember how to get back, but I, I had to get it picked up. I take, I, I God, take it you were. Uh, that's not the missus that you ended up marrying. Don't so know, later no, on, no, just, <laughs> per- did did you end up marrying uh, Miss Northwest? I did. That's another story. That was. Uh, <laughs> 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 Go on then. <laughs> Look, love. Look, yeah. This is how it's, did that, did it's going to work. You're going to win. But <laughs> did that come from the five? The five in a yeah. day? Did it? Yeah, she was Miss Northwest. She was a student at Coleraine University, as you know, it's just up the road here. Studying to be a teacher. She's a you, good. Te- she's a good teacher. Is, does, uh, does she teach now? Yeah, she does. Oh, is it, what's she's getting older now, though. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> I used to say I had to go and meet the wife at school. You know, and they look at me. No, no, she's a teacher. She's not a pupil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't you? It's like you know, I'm gonna oh meet my sure. I can't say I'm gonna meet meet my wife at school. You know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Did you, did you meet at the racing type of thing, like at the Northwest? No, what happened to her? She was a pretty girl then. Pretty good, pretty good. I mean, so, does she not watch podcasts or something like that? Is this why you say it? Yeah, she doesn't. <laughs> I'll go ch- carry on, crack on. Then. And, uh, so, uh, 
just like <laughs> she's into education and teaching. She's yeah, she into, definitely won't be watching this. 100%. And she doesn't like she doesn't like motorbikes anymore either. So there's no trouble. Right, happy to take it all <laughs> but, the boxes here. Yeah. So anyway, what happened? She was you only find out all these things afterwards. So there's a bit of past and presence. Um, so her teacher she was a pretty girl at school student. She noticed like you've met them yourself at times, and her friends had persuaded her to enter Miss Northwest because you know the students are up here, the Northwest's on. It's a big, big thing. So that's her story anyway. So she entered Miss Northwest and she won it. That was okay. And um, I'm racing. I'd never seen her in my life before. Had a, you know. So and to be honest, as we know in our racing, uh, not sure about your girlfriends and stuff, but they sort of understand really that. Terrible to say, we're very selfish and motorbikes come first. You know, we've you've probably lost girlfriends, I've lost other girlfriends because motorbikes came first. You know, what happened to me once or twice was I used to go to the motorcycle shop in Banbridge, buying motorcycles to get parts for my 125. So instead of the girlfriend, right, we're in the car, just have to stop here and get some parts for my bike. That's okay. And I'd go to buy motorcycles, the boys would be there in the bike shop, eight o'clock at night, and everybody's talking. When I forget, maybe two hours later, shit, <laughs> girlfriend's in the car. <laughs> <laughs> easily done, Philip, easily. Uh, I know exactly what you mean, easily done. <laughs> I wonder how many blokes are watching this with a lass in the car. They'll be just yeah. staring at them. Like, yeah, but they'll know. Don't you yes. dare yeah. do that to me. <laughs> Things have changed a little bit now with boyfriend, girlfriend. You, you couldn't get away with that. <laughs> but You got away with it. But only for a bit. You know, so I did lose a few good girlfriends because I left them in the car. You know, and it was... <laughs> I, I cracked a window, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> just wind down the window. Pair, I'll be yeah. the what window. are you moaning about? <laughs> there's, some more, there's some more in the glove compartment. <laughs> Do you know, I'm very lucky. I think I was always clever enough to take the keys out. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> They couldn't really drive away, could they? Oh my god! <laughs> if you love me, you'll stay. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so love, I, love will only last for so long. Yeah. Two hours in your sat in the, yeah, sat in the car by yourself. Um, yeah. So, yeah. How did you meet this? Uh, the uh, the, your, your the wife. wife. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> in school. <laughs> she, she hadn't even started school then. <laughs> Not as a teacher. <laughs> she was trained to be a teacher. Let's get it right here. <laughs> so anyway, it was the Northwest and you just want to win races. So we went to the Northwest. We knew we had a chance, right? You know, because I was winning races. By this time, yeah, I've got my Hondas. My Hondas were all competitive. My 250s, super quick. You know, my 600 wasn't just the quickest. And uh, at a 400 VFR, 400 on my RC30. So, uh it was actually tough. It was tough, tough going, you know. But anyway, we started. We won the first race and went up and I seen Miss Northwest. You know, it's only now there's a couple of pictures afterwards. Miss Northwest, you know, they go around the riders and take the pictures and do the stuff and all. But I was so focused. I didn't really notice her because I want to win races. I'm here to win races, not get a girlfriend. To be honest, I had a girlfriend. So I didn't need another one, did I? <laughs> 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 we <met him. laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't a greedy person. One girlfriend's enough for anyone. One girlfriend, a motorbike, that's takes up, and I had my mom. So oh, there we are. Yes. So anyway, we win the first one, and uh, we we'll go up, and Miss Northwest was there. Blah blah, and we, you know, you've been up in the Ross and better banter stuff, and you go. I said, don't worry, sure, yeah, I can't talk to you. I'll see you next time. You know, I'll be up again. I will. Next time, up again, I'm to number two, up again. That becomes three, I'm up again. I'm getting confident by now, I'm to, yeah, don't worry, I'll be up again. You know, number four, I'm up again, right? Two races to go, last two races, car, let's not forget, car, six <laughs> races of car. And You're going home with me <laughs> in that piece I, of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I forget the name of the car, it was a funny name, a foreign name. And, uh, Tesla. <laughs> no, no I take that one. <laughs> and uh, really, I suppose what we should have this year at the Northwest, isn't it? There you are, a planting Tesla. seeds. Planting seeds. Yeah. Get, get on the phone to Elon. Yeah, wouldn't it? He's got a few uh, billion, so we'll get him to sponsor the event and everything. So. Yeah, wouldn't it? It'd be really good because, you know, I tell you what, there'd be more than Hutchy or more than Hecky trying for that, wouldn't there? Mm, for you a know, Tesla. You yeah. can imagine Ulster Sealy going again. 
and then Glenn yeah. Irwin think he's going to beat both of them. Next All thing you'll get Andrew Irwin looking to go too. <laughs> oh God, I, yeah, the BFAQ, mind. Get, throw in a couple of Rolexes yeah. in there. Get like the Daytona. Anyway, we digress. Yeah. Anyway, back, right. back, back to this podium with the woman. So anyway. back to anyway. Thought I'll be up again anyway. You know, Jesus Christ, and they're going crashing that one. Number five. I wasn't back up at all. I'm on land on the side of the road. Had to wait for the course car to come pick me up. I was actually glad because I was getting tired by now. I remember thinking, you know, you can imagine, you know, five Northwest races by now and you've had all practice. It's hard work, as you know, mentally and physically to win races, boys, isn't easy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I remember when I slid off, it was when we turned up to, up to the magic ride about on the little link road. I lost the front, right? And we can go back to why that happened, right? And what happened really was, so I was going quite good and I was getting help and guidance from everybody. And Michelin gave me this new front tire. And the idea of the Northwest was, it was like a more pointy tire, right? So the rolling resistance would be much less, you know, and there were there were GP tires in fact, and because I was winning and Michelin wanted me to keep on winning, they were helping me with all they could. And uh, so this pretty pointy tire, right? And so the rolling resistance was all the rest. But what happened, and I remember at the Northwest, but I just kept on riding. It would feel sort of like light in some corner stuff. And what happened really was this time what really happened was the sides of that tire was getting cold, you know, after the big straights. So instead of having a nice round profile that was warm everywhere and you could do what you wanted with it, I was still trying to do what I want with it. But it was only afterwards I realised the sides were getting cold. So when I braked hard and tipped it in to go up the link road, the front just wiped out. You know, luckily it was no damage when you slide off like that, mm. so there was no problem, you know. And we didn't find that out really until the TT two weeks later. When I'm going to the TT, again, I want to be a winner, don't I? I'd won five Northwest and I hadn't won a TT by that time. I was 1992 and I hadn't won a TT. Right. So uh, I'm going how, to, many, how many years prior were you doing the TT? Uh, 89 was my first one. Right. That was my first ever, the 750 race that we've never talked about yet. Yeah. So, yeah, my first 750 race ever, official big race, was the Isle of Man TT, mm. the Formula One race, you know. And what made us under a little bit of pressure, Joey Dunlop got injured. So, anyway, the Kawasaki deal, let's go back to that, ended up Kawasaki and I fell out because the bikes weren't competitive and I was crashing and they let me out of the agreement because the bikes weren't competitive. And then, lucky, lucky, eh... Uh, Lucky, Joey Dunlop got hurt. You won't remember because you're probably too young, but Joey had a big crash at Brands Hatch. Joey Dunlop was the hero. I can't remember the name of the superbike rider that took him out at Paddock Bend, I think it was, and Joey was smashed to bits. Mm. 1989, start of the season. So that meant no Joey Dunlop. Now that to Honda is like... Massive my blow, God, yeah. The God is gone. and uh, But Hizzy was coming up at that time on Foggy. So what happened then? So Honda said, if Kawasaki release you, it was actually Joey. I might as well tell this story for people who don't know. So what happened? The Northwest was a disaster on the Kawasaki's. The officials, you know, Mervyn White, they told me, you're not racing your 750 at the Northwest. I'm going, I am. They go, no, you're not. I've called it Clark, of course, sorry. You know what you're called after practice? You called and you think of something wrong, don't you? You might have called me to the Clark, of course. Clark, of course, you called here, Philip, because you're not racing your 750. I go, I am. No, you're not. I am. What was the reason? <sighs> Apparently, there was a lot of complaints from the marshals and all the uh, safety people riding the course that this bike was going down the Matterpole <laughs> from side to side. I was using the whole road. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was uh, just, we couldn't stop it weaving. Wow. <laughs> you know? That must be uh, that must be pretty rare. That to call someone up and say you're not riding on safety grounds. Yeah, like that that mustn't well, happen very often. Thank God, there's not the same podcast around now, you know then than there was now. So stuff on you know the phones and all weren't around. So when this happened, it didn't spread the same, did it? It was just you know you've been told <laughs> until the pub later on. <laughs> yeah, you should have seen this bike, man. Whoa, that's it. Yeah, well, I was coming down the Matterpole. That is the truth. Like in my practice, and this thing was weaving just. The 750, it was the first stage of the 750 Kawasaki and it wasn't right. And no one really had rode it, at, you know, 180 plus miles an hour much. So I remember like fighting it, you know, to, you know, down a matter, poof, right. You know, we'd stay in this thing and I, and I hadn't got the brains to roll it off. I just kept it going, thinking I'll ride through it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people thinking I'm a tart. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, really I'm, I'm, I'm holding it. it, you know what I mean? So. 
<laughs> so we're left just, so there's the Northwest, you know, that I'd been threatening to win and I had no 750. So all I had was my 600. And then the 600 race, that blew up. So it did. So I'm going home. For, you know, I can't remember if it blew up or something happened. Anyway, I'm out of that race too. So there, this, you know, potential new boy winner was coming home from the Northwest with his tongue hanging out with nothing. And all my team and, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong? And so I went to Joey's pub. And uh, this is the truth. So we went, me and my girlfriend. The <laughs> Did girl you take friend, her out the car this time? Yeah, yeah. She, <laughs> no, she was right. She was a good girl. She <laughs> was from a motorcycle and family. So, you know, there was no problem. It was great to have a girlfriend who understood bikes and all the rest. And we had a good relationship and all. So anyway, we both went to the Joey's pub. This was Sunday about lunchtime. We left the Northwest. We're going home. And it's like, we're just chins. Just we were finished. So went to Joey's pub, didn't expect to see him, but by that time I'd actually got a bit of a relationship with Joey. He had seen me, what really happened the year before, uh, when I was a young boy coming up and winning races and smashing lap records on my 250 Honda. Joey had a 250 Honda, but he, Joey had to so much work to do to his big bikes, his 750 and all, that he hadn't done much work to his 250 Honda. And I was winning, so I give him stuff that I had done. I was only too glad to tell him, you know, Joey, of course I'll tell you what I'm doing. And I lent him. He won the 250 that year, the TT 88, and he had a lot of parts off my bike and his. So he had, he had, I remember he couldn't get sprockets the right size and I lent him another stuff. I thought I was great lenting Joey to lot my stuff. So by now, Joey and I had not a friendship relationship, but a bit of respect for each other. I respected him as a hero. And I think he must have respected me as a young lad coming along because he knows how hard it is to win races. So anyway, we're at the bar sitting. I got a beer. He was sitting there and we just took a beer and he just looked over and he says, you know, it's my bikes you should be riding. No, it's Hondas you should be riding, not Kawasaki's. And I remember, I looked at my girlfriend, she looked at me, we looked at each other, and then I looked back at him, and it was, she just, what'd you Have say? You just said that, yeah. Ah, you know, he says, you know, you should be riding Hondas, not them Kawasaki's. And I goes, well, how do we do that? You know, he says, Joe was dead, but he says, I'd speak to Honda on Monday. So, just like that. Just like that. And so he was injured. He was bit, I can't remember. He was pretty badly broken up his arms and stuff, I think. And I can't remember all his injuries, but they were pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And um, so what happened anyway? We managed to talk through that week. Kawasaki agreed to release me from my contract with that signed up. And Bob McMillan then agreed to give me Hondas. But it was joy because he agreed to give me his, he gave me his 125, his 250. And in theory, he was giving me his 750. But it wasn't really his to give at that time. Uh, so what Honda had, so Honda then gave me a 600. So Honda gave me a new 600 at Joey's 125, Joey's 250. And I went to the TT. And what they had planned by the time I got there was I got Hizzy's old 750. So Hizzy 750, I got it. And Hizzy got Joey's factory bike. So there was a factory bike for Joey that he wasn't fit to ride now. Hizzy got that, I got his. And... That was the start of it, you know, so. Do you know, uh, growing up, uh, did you just like completely idolise Joy Dunlop? And uh, what, what's the age gap, just so I can try and understand? Like when you were 20, how old roughly was Joy? Joy must have been, Jesus, really bad, because I should know this off by heart. Everybody knows Joy's age and Joy's stuff. I'd say Joy was easy 10 or 15 years older than so me. So almost like the generation above. Yeah, the generation above, really, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Even though... You know, I started racing after him. I finished racing before him and he still was racing. And he won TTs in 99, wasn't it? Mm. And I finished racing really in 99, 98, 99. Wow. And uh, <coughs> so where were we there a minute ago? But, uh, Just kind of going through the Kawasaki switch to Honda. Yeah, so that was my really, that was my start with Honda. And You I couldn't said, have had that any better. You know, like, like an people in, well, that's it. People in this sport, you know, I feel like having that mentor and having someone actually put a word in the right ear yeah. is a huge advantage in this game. People don't realize that. So when you've yeah. got the legend that is Joey Dunlop getting on the phone going, 
hello, I've got another lad here. Yeah. <laughs> Get him on the bike. That's there, huge. There was a fantastic uh, picture you put on Instagram not so long ago of uh, all Honda boys. and uh, I mean, you all look so young, but uh, Foggy's there. Alan Carter's on the left. Yeah. The middle. There's a, there must be about five or six of you. I think it's the yeah. latest picture that you've put on Instagram. Yeah. But, uh, yeah it's, uh, it's... Uh, millions. I'm going to start putting more of those pictures up because I have millions and millions of pictures. Mm -hmm. I've always liked pictures because pictures tell a story. You yeah. know? I bet I, you've had some wild nights out. Not so much, really, to be honest. So, right. uh, but there's one. Was, there's always one in every man's mind, and we're going to pick it away. Come on, the most wild night. <laughs> He's got one. I can see. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I've, just while you mentioned about uh, Joey's bar, we we just yeah. popped down. I've never been before. Um, uh, we just we just popped down there a few hours ago. It was really nice to go, and we went to the Memorial Garden, yeah. and uh, real like a, a real special place. And you know, like um, yeah, just. Uh, it was quite, yeah, it was quite like poignant, wasn't it? Just sat there having it, like, I was dumb having a And to, to all our listeners, they, they know Chrissy's tea tall, but I did force him to have a sip of a Guinness. So he's officially <laughs> yeah. had a Guinness in Joey's bar. So I don't, they I, are, I don't drink, all, but I did have a little there'll uh, be people taste. Pull, there'll be people yeah. pulling over and pausing and going, did he actually do that? So well done, Chrissy. I'm personally very proud of his son. Very, very proud no, of No, brilliant. I'm proud of you too. But no, Joey, Joey was, I'm not going to say he was my idol, but he was a... I don't really have idols in that, but you have people who you respect, you know, yeah. and you respect. I'm a tradesman, really. I'm an engineer, uh, aluminium, stainless steel fabrication, all that stuff. So when you understand a trade and understand the use of your hands, you understand someone special, you yeah. know, and you boys know riding a bike, you know, you've got to know what you, you've got to be special to win races and know what you're doing. So in my eyes, Joey was a special person to handle a bike like that and win races, you know, and, um, uh, can I, uh, Go on ahead. I'll just mention, uh, you just said about uh, how a photo can, you know, say a thousand words. And sometimes when you see pictures of people riding, especially on the roads, they kind of, you, you could look at like, say, 10, 20, 30 different riders and around the same corner and they all look like quite similar. Uh, just having a flick, quick flick through your Instagram there, there's like, there's one word that stands out looking at most of your pictures and it's just C commitment <laughs> like you just look at a picture in fact i, I posted <laughs> just, one on the patreon page bef just before i'll show you it. Uh, I, I just yeah. took took it off your instagram there like but yeah just every picture you look like proper tucked in and like you you, you definitely look like you were putting 100 putting it on the line yeah every race in my life yeah yeah that, that one it's, there that's that's an ace picture that ah uh, yes what year was that, was that? good that was 90 hold on 94 was it and you know that was like a that is just mint that too that bike you know we can all people I don't blame my bikes because things go wrong but that was a tough tough time because uh, Hizzy and I were teammates then and you know Hizzy was a good road racer but I thought I could match Hizzy you know so that TT was going to be a tough tough one they were RC for that was our first year it must have been 94 that was our first year of RC 45s and um uh, RC 45s, as you know from people, they weren't the best the first year. Right? You know, you had to do lots and lots of modifications to, to get an RC 45 to win. So to do what we'd done on the roads and those bikes was unreal, really. But I can't remember if that was the first race or the second race. But So in the first race, we're going to the TT. Hizzy's probably favoured to win, but I want to beat him, don't I? You know, and uh, so we had, there was a shortage of parts all. And what we got made was we have got lots of, engineering companies in Northern Ireland and you couldn't get springs, you know, a 10, a 10 point. I was pretty into being engineering and trying to get my bike. So, you know, I wanted a 10, a 10.1, a 10.2, a 10.3 that I could change all the stuff the way I wanted. And we couldn't buy these springs and Honda didn't have them. And there was only so much kit stuff. And his, he would have been ahead of me for getting the best stuff first, you know, because he was allegedly the better rider. So has he got some kit stuff that I didn't get and all but I got springs made for that bike, you know. And I remember if it wasn't that race, but not sure if that was the F1 or the senior, but in the first one, in the F1 race, we had thought up ready to go, but I rode my nuts off, right? But I couldn't, I couldn't get it together. This, the bike, well, I couldn't get speed. I couldn't, I mean, we're going fast, of course, but fast for second place, not first. You know, I wanted yeah. to win. Second place is good, like, but you know, I wanted to win. And do you know what happened on it by the rear spring collapsed, right? So the spring, whatever happened, the tension it collapsed to about maybe I'm gonna say half an inch shorter. 
That's massive in this game. That is massive. So that is why, and some of them shots you look at, I'm going to study them more, that the back end of that bike's down too much. And that was why I was struggling to turn it and get out of turns. So the back end, the ride height, I think was down, and I'm being serious here, something like 50 or 75 mil. It was massive. And for listeners that aren't understanding, it's <coughs> essentially like going from train track riding where everything's planted and lovely to getting on a jet ski and that the arse is down yes, and you can't turn. It's so, That's huge. Because when we came back in, I said to the boys, my mechanic, Dennis, and that, I goes, look, there's something wrong. It's just There's something wrong. I didn't know what it was. There's something wrong. And it was only when we got back to the garage that night and I lifted the bike. You could lift the bike up and you could shake the spring in the shock. That's how bad, how it, bad was it was when it was lifted up. You know, but I'm not making excuses. Hezzy was a bloody good rider, mm. so if you beat Hezzy, you're doing well. That, that was that uh, picture I was talking about where there's the five of you. Yes, I. Good old Alan Carter, you know. So who's in, that, who's in that photo there, yeah. Chrissy? So, so, oh, I, so yeah, Jamie Whitham, Alan Philip, uh, Hislop, and Carl Fogarty. God, and, uh, damn. They all look so young. There, yeah, like. we're like kids. There's even younger looking pictures than that of us, you know. Yeah. I think of that was maybe 1990 or so. I'm, I'm really um, good friends with Alan Carter. Oh, yeah. yeah um, do, you, do you keep in touch with him? I do indeed. I talk do, to him every now and then. Do you have any good stories with him? Hey, Alan, uh, probably the, the the story, uh, the worst story about Alan was uh, sort of, Honda and them days weren't too well known for giving you extra stuff. We had a team manager that was pretty tight with the budget, you know, and uh, we're not, I'm not going to say who it was or anything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, but he didn't like wasting stuff, you know what I mean? And the budget was a budget and that was the stuff and that's all you're getting and that's it. And poor Alan, he remembers it. He had to buy two spark plugs for his bike towards the end of the Shut season. Shut up, man. He'll tell you about it himself, will Alan, because there wasn't enough budget left. He had to buy two spark plugs. And I thought if Alan Carter had to buy two spark plugs, there's something wrong. That is bad, isn't it? You know, you, ah, that, yeah. if Alan everyone's there to, to win. In the you, have, you, have you done a podcast with Alan yet? We did that right at the beginning of the podcast. In the we'll, early days. We'll, yeah, we need, to, we need to get him in. Cause we've had this huge, this is episode, it'll be like around 140. <laughs> 1,200, like yeah. something like that. 140-ish, <laughs> we've been doing yeah. it for three years. But um. They, we got this studio built at around episode 45, something like that. So the first sort of, you know, year of the podcast, we did it on Skype. That's yeah, it was proper pirate radio then, mind. <laughs> yeah. Proper pirate radio. Well, you know, if you get Alan going, he can talk about his... Uh, He'll tell us the name of the Honda man, I'm telling you. <laughs> You're straight, I'll you say did, it. Did, um, sorry, I'm just thinking, going back to, do you know when you were talking about the, the lady that you ended up marrying? Yes, so you we never her, finished that story. Yeah, you seen we? her on the podium and then you didn't, you crashed out of the race, but then yeah. you, you had a different girlfriend at the time. So how did that happen? Yeah, so really, you know, I had a good girlfriend. I didn't ever, I didn't want another girlfriend at that time, you know, almost enough. Mm -hmm. And anyway, but it was just a bit of banter. You no, know, she was a pretty girl too, but I wasn't interested in getting a new girlfriend. I didn't need one. So any of the sick three of us, I'm back up. <clears throat> I went again and said, I told you to be back, didn't I? You know, and the, that night after the Northwest, there used to be a big party and a dinner and if you're riding in bed. So yeah, I spoke to her. I don't even think I swapped numbers or anything that night because I wasn't interested. But over the next, it might have been months or a year later before I seen her again. I said I'd see her sometime, you know, but you say that to lots of people when you're riding, okay, you know, yeah, I'll see you. I'll, you know, because there's a lot of, what you do meet in this game, and we do it, <coughs> excuse me, we do it every day and I, we do meet a lot of good people, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the motorcycle business, you know, that's my, my full time job, motorcycle business and e-bikes now, but you meet so many good people and, you know, these people you can, you do say I'll see you again because they're interested to talk about something, you meet people with many different jobs, hobbies, interests and, and I like talking to people about other things and in general, you can see I talk a bit, but it's uh, it's good stuff. So, you know, I said, look, I'll see you, I'll talk to you again or something sometime. And I don't actually remember when we met again, but it was a fair while after that or whatever. And then I met her and my other girlfriend and I had, this was way later, by the way, you know. We there, there was no crossover. <laughs> <laughs> there was no trial no, period. No, there, was, there was no crossover. So we had to sort of, this sort of, Trouble happened here, whatever reason, and mm -hmm. and my life was changing because by this time after ninety two I moved to England 
you know, my sort of Irish racing was then I went to ride for Honda in England in the BSB stuff. It wasn't BSB then, like British Championship stuff. Yeah. But really, I had a hard time in that because what happened, as you know, in 1992, RC30s were finished. And Simon Creffer, the famous Simon Creffer, who's also my mate, he rode, he was in the Honda team. So I had lots of good Honda team members over the years. Even John Kosinski, do you remember him and our mm -hmm. Honda team? So at one stage, you see, we were all based at Louth. You know, the World Superbikes was based there. Motocross was based there. Uh, the BS, uh, my road racing team was based there. And the we, British team. We were there a few weeks ago, actually. Yeah, well. We had this parked outside. Do you know the back where the lorries come in? Yes, well, it's changed a little bit in my, but my other unit was over there, you know, and stuff. And, um... Where do we get to? I keep losing, boys. I tell, I tell you what, Lauren just walked in. She's offered. Would, would you like a beer? You'd, oh yeah, you're a good one. man. Right? Lauren's going to have one. Oh, yes. I'm going to have one with you. Screw it. Right. Chris is nothing. Right, well, so yeah, there you go. Go. <laughs> Chris has got his rich energy. <laughs> and, uh, so when you talk about wild nights out and all, really. So when I was racing, we did. You had the odd party night, but I was serious, as you see from the pictures. You know, I was. I wanted to. When I'm an engineer, I want to build the best engineering thing I can. We just that's why we win races. You know, you want to do the best job you can in your job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wanted to win races. So I trained quite a lot, you know, into as healthy eating as you could. So you go, I was so always bad. um <laughs> cheers. Cheers, you cheers. <laughs> Love this podcast. <laughs> ah. I've earned that with a talk. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, so I trained good and you see from the pictures, I gave it a hundred percent. So I wasn't really, I was never a drinker, you know? Yeah. When you, you know, from your sort of 16 to your 18 or 19 or sorry, 18 to your 20, you know, the legal age, you know, you want to have a drink and you want to try it out and you think it's great and you know, to get drunk and all, but really, and, and smoke, I never was a smoker. Cause yeah, I remember, you know, my friends, she's smoking. I tried to smoke, but it made me cough and splutter and I go, why the hell? My friends used to keep going until they stopped coughing. I'm going, why the hell would you know, cigarettes? Yeah. Why do I want to cough? I've got this great idea. Yeah, um, <laughs> it you it makes you stink, gives you bad teeth. It give, it can increase your chance of lung cancer. It costs you a fortune. Oh, great! And what's the good thing? Well, there is no good thing. It's it's all negative. Yeah. It's like why why on earth would you want to start? And girlfriends here, you know, know, decent girls don't want to kiss a nice tray, do that? You know. <laughs> 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 It's like, uh, do you know when you see someone, it, if it's like, image it's, of a man, it, uh, it's like blowing a gale, blowing a storm and someone's like waiting to get in the car and they stand and you're just thinking like, what on earth are you doing, man? Yeah. So I never, so drink also was, so yeah, I had a go at it from I was 18 to I was 20 or so, but then I started racing and I thought, you know, racers don't drink, you know, even though in my days, you know, allegedly racers did get drunk a lot and do all this stuff, but I wanted to focus on racing. All I wanted to do was race. And what I found out pretty quick was that if you won races, you got prize money, right? <laughs> you know, it was, you know, and we all, you know, from racing, we need money. Every penny, we need it. So if I win races, I can get prize money. And then I found out after that, not only could I get prize money, I actually can get help. Now, I thought you were going to say you would get kills. <laughs> <laughs> and Did that's when the real that? motivation came in. <laughs> Look, I have got a happy wife. I've got. <laughs> So, hold on, you told this sis ten minutes ago she doesn't listen, so you just spill it, young No, she doesn't listen, but her friends might. <laughs> you know, like that's not forget she's a teacher. Imagine, you know, when, when and some like... teachers are motorbike fanatics, and mm. some teachers will. So you can imagine the school down the road. You, you know, you know her husband. Do you, do you know what he does for a living? He's a teacher. I'm I'm a I've checked him oh, out. Right. Oh, chap. <laughs> what, do, what does the missus teach? Maps. Yeah, primary school. Oh, oh damn it! Oh, Abbott right. Hamas. We'll go back to that one, right? So. Uh, yeah, so she teaches uh, P1s and P2s, you know, and she's a special needs coordinator and she's pastoral care and she's everything. So she's passionate. She loves teaching. Yeah. Like, and helping kids. Like, I love motorbikes. We're okay. So, yes, yeah, she does maths, but uh, I will tell my daughter about this. My, my son and daughter, they're pretty into their education as well, you know. So um, they've both done, uh, a, what do you call it, maths and maths plus or something like that. Is there advanced maths? Further maths. Further maths, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they've both done maths and further maths and sort of 100% kids. And we girl and I, um, she's a, gets 100%, but she's going to Queen's University now. So oh, she's, Fair play. She's doing a clinical psychology 
in Queens, so she loves her ma's. Clinical um, psychology. Like, my dad was a professional motorcycle racer. This is my case study. He, the old boy was tapped <laughs> to an inch of his fucking life. <laughs> what, a, yeah. what a great piece. This is <laughs> sad. I think she's got to try, trying to work our house out, you know. So, oh, yes. mom's a teacher, dad's a psycho, <laughs> she's a psychologist, you know, and the son, well, he's sex- I was about to say, what's the boy do? Um, we're trying to get him. He's he's doing his A levels now, so he's doing uh, economics and maths and IT and uh, there's another one. There's four A levels, isn't there? I, well, I did maths, English, uh, maths, economics, and physics. Is he doing physics? No, uh, he was business going. Business. He was going down that yeah, business. So he's doing economics, business, maths, and IT. Oh, fantastic! You know, so he's going to go into. Summer. So now that we're on the family route, is is the the lad wanted to put a set of levers on? Is he want to go? Follow, no, thankfully, follow what happened there, right, was the wife now by this time, she doesn't, she thinks she knows she's smarter than I am, obviously, so she knows more to bags are dangerous and dirty. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, so have you managed to persuade your son away? Yeah, from yeah. So why would you have you know mix your children up with it? You know. The little girl, she was probably a bit interested in bikes and bicycles, but she went the girly route, you know, dancing, <laughs> drama, singing, piano, da 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 stuff. And um, so the wee boy, he was always sort of thankful in one way. If he would have been interested in motorbikes, it would have been very hard, you know, because we've got a motorcycle business and we've access to all this stuff and we've access to information. So you would have had to give him a hundred percent wouldn't you you'd have had to do you know, just on that subject if if you uh if he had had a keen interest in bike racing really competitive and he wanted to go down that route obviously you've had so much from the world of road racing as in like mm. uh pure road racing would you um would you kind of let him lead what he would want to do in t- terms of like if you wanted to do short circuits or roads or do you try and guide him in one way or the other you would try to guide them the best way you could. But when somebody's passionate, as you know from being a teacher and my wife being a teacher, you've got to let people have their own route. You know, you can't, you see a lot of dads, you know, um, I was at some bicycle racing today and, um, you know, I could see a couple of dads that were more into it than the kids was. You know, my wee boy, what happened to him? So he wasn't really, he was interested in football. We don't know why now, because there's no footballers in the house. I don't hear I don't even like football. I do like football, but you know I don't. I wouldn't mind the paycheck. That, that's the only thing about football. That's I the only like. thing good. <laughs> but but you know when you go to all the facts and figures, you know there's thousands and thousands of kids chasing that one position. You know there is only you know fifteen positions if you count subs and all in a football team, and there's thousands of kids from that area chasing that. So if you're a realist and you look at it, how many is going to get through? How many is going to be disappointed? If you're going to set your whole heart on being a footballer, yeah, you know the out of millions, there's only hundreds make it that get that check. So there's a, it's a bit like motorbike racing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the pool's a lot a lot bigger, isn't it, in football terms? Yes, isn't it? Yeah, if yeah. you do get there, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. Yeah. So he was down the football route, his football, and uh, so he wasn't thankfully he wasn't interested in bikes. I think mommy somehow secretly done a a good job of teaching the kids that you know motorbikes are dangerous and dirty Indoc- indoctrinating them from a young age <laughs> yes you know <laughs> look into my eyes the eyes the eyes not around the eyes look into the eyes yeah um, <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah done a good job that to keep them away from but if they wanted to you know what I mean so we don't know where he got it from but he went down this football uh, route okay but let's talk in hypothetical terms the lad said, look, I want to be a motorcycle race, everything. You, you went down that route. What happens if your lad at like 22, 23 turned up as that 100 mile an hour man and became the 107 man? <laughs> How would that, whoa, that would be, that would be, as a dad, that would be terrifying, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, it would, would be, wouldn't it? I don't know how you cope with that. Yeah. I think it, really my, my route, um, I mean, my mum, you know, she watched my mum, didn't come to any races really mm. you know she watched the the newspapers you know and, and all that there was no it you know no website stuff in them days so all we had to do the rule was after every road race you phone mom to say we're okay 
and what there used to be in those days, you boys won't remember this, but those phone boxes, you've probably seen them in pictures, red things. You used to have them in, my, in my village. I remember as a young kid, the little red boxes, like yeah. telephone boxes. Well, it's got didn't. loads of suspicious numbers with Chrissy <laughs> Rouse's photo next to it. Call this number. <laughs> For tutoring. <laughs> yeah, tutoring. <laughs> actually, 0800. I was actually, I should go back to that. My wee daughter, she tutors, she tutors Maz. Yeah, me too. Do you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's got a couple of GCSE pupils and a couple of A, a, a level pupils. Great and, little part time job. Yeah, but she loves it. You know, she just, like, we love this. She loves tutoring, you know, so. Yeah. And, uh, uh, stuff. But no matter, like, get back to where do we, we drifted there. Talk about the, um, if the lad, if your boy came home, oh, yes, it's like it's the younger your the spitting image of you, the young hooligan sliding in at Cookstown on the oil. I think you'd have to, um, you would have to help him. Of course, you would, yeah. if that's the route he decides. But I think it would be a scary route. Would be, wouldn't it? You know, it would be. Uh, to, but I think it's great that any dad is, and you know, I've got lots of friends like you boys have, you know. Uh, in the racing world where their dad lucky today it's like you know Johnny Ray you know Johnny Ray is in a is in a position where he I think his young lads are playing on motocross bikes now I think yeah 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 um, oh, we, we were just there the other day so they're right. in the football and like scrambling and everything like that yeah so. so but I think it's really brilliant that he's in a position he can help a kid do that yeah because when we were trying to get into motorbikes younger you know we had to I don't know how you boys did it, but it was hard. You know, you were begging for sponsorship, fifty pound for your calendar square, and you were you were doing everything you could to to try and get some money to get a new tire. You know, to get whatever. Whereas I think it's brilliant that those people are in a position that they can help them. You know, that they've got good tires, you've got good stuff, and then you can see in a pretty in a pretty short time if you know, like it's it sort of. I was lucky really, but I know other guys that it took them years and years and years to get a decent bike. Yes. To, to prove you're a winner because you can't win without the bike really mm -hmm. you know yeah. was I was sort of lucky in a short time the best thing I had two sponsors who bought me that RS 250 Honda you know so in 1988 I had the exact same right same bike as Joey Dunlop as Stephen Cull so you can't make before that my Rotax was like about seven or eight years old mm. a spawn and frame you know steel spawn and frame and a 250 Rotax engine that we weren't really sure how to work properly. Yeah, that would have taken a long time to build the career. Yes. Yeah, on that, yeah. Do you know from doing these podcasts, obviously uh, the same sort of names keep cropping up from the past and uh, two people that always, always end up getting mentioned at some point is uh, uh, Joey Dunlop and his lop. And um, obviously you're in a very unique position where you, you knew both blokes very well and teammates with both. What what were the both like, sort of away from away from all the cameras and whatever, just you know, be in the garage with them and like sort of spending time at hotels and stuff. Uh, what what were they like, sort of personally? But both were really really good guys, and I believe I believe I had a really good relationship with both of them. You know, uh, like Joey was a special guest at my wedding. You know, that's how good of friends we were you know I'm still friends with Joey's wife I'm still friends with his family you know and if if they wanted me for some reason there's no problem they can ring me you yeah, know and if I wanted something from Linda there's no problem I do I don't speak to her as often because of all this COVID lockdown stuff mm. but before that we would meet quite a lot you know so at my wedding for instance Joey rode off we had a white gold wing for me to ride off but we had a nice little setup between him and I that he got on the gold wing and he rode off in the church with my wife on the back you know <laughs> you know there's Joy's rode off with your wife you know <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know so there's a lot of pictures good of luck <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Bit <laughs> yeah you can keep her <laughs> no no Pat that's not true <laughs> What are you gonna do now? I'm off to judge Miss Northwest. See what happens here. Yeah. <laughs> see if there's any young stuff. You know, <laughs> <laughs> younger than fifty. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, brilliant. But uh, yeah, so they were both like, you know, uh, Joy was a good person. You know, he helped me, guide me. But we had some tough races too. You know, one race at the Ulster Grand Prix. You know, we were like. You know, he he's he's twenty six wins around the Ulster Grand Prix course. You know, Jesus. I think I've only got fifteen or something. You know, but uh, you know, one of those races down through Quarry Bends, I was adamant I was going to beat him. He was, 
Joey was a spy. He was a good, he was just an ordinary good person. But you see, when he wanted to win, you know, you weren't going to beat him. You know, there was, but in the Ulster Grand Prix, Joey would make one effort. He would have four or five races and he would make one effort in one race, you know, and you had to beat him, you know, whereas I made that effort in every race. You know, but I was younger than him, obviously, you know, and it's like that time at the TT there in his last year, 99, where he beat David Jeffries and he beat all of them. You know, he made that effort when he put all that effort in one race in a road, he was going to be hard to beat, you know. Was there ever a time that your friendship came in to sort of distribute, distribute over on, like say on track, like it was a bit close and it sort of got a bit feisty off track as well? Got a bit feisty with his wife, Linda. Really? So what happened in that Ulster Grand Prix one, you know, Linda, we're lucky, we laugh about it now. But anyway, it was Quarry Bands, the Ulster Grand Prix, you might know about it, you might not. And have you raced at the Ulster? Yes, Any, I You have? have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know Quarry Bands, so down the big long right at the last and then you flick left. So the big long right that goes round before that overflow bog, you've got a left oh, yeah, hander yeah, yeah. and a right. Before that, there's a right and then there's a left hander. Then there's a big long right, then a left and down to start and finish. Yes, I. Well, <coughs> the one before I keep getting the corners mixed up. I said before flow bog, so I was adamant I'm going to beat him, right? So we're like now going ahead. I think someone wants you there. I think the 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 the. the Someone's trying to steal this truck. I feel it moving, you know, so <laughs> need to. they're probably trying to kidnap the three of us, you know, trying to steal our beer. That, or that's it. That's but it. It's all kicking off. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, it was the Ulster Grand Prix and Joey was good right there. And I'm good right there too. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we came to that right hand at the top of that right there. Out of the hairpin, you know, the right before yep. the left. And I'm adamant. I'm going to get him. Right. So I'm right up the inside there in the right. That's tight. That's tight, right? And then uh, he kept coming over. He wasn't going to stop. I'm right up the side of him, right? My wheel is now running down the side of his leathers. No, yeah. So anyway, uh, you've been there and it's just, yes, no, yes, no. And I thought, no, you know, I'm not a chicken, but. This, this no, is danger. I'm, I'm not being funny, but if you're rubbing, if you're if you front wheel against another man, if like, yeah, I think we're at the limit here, son. <laughs> That's definitely not being a chicken. Far from it. It's like there is physically no room here. No, there's Fair no room. Play. Yeah. There's no room. So, but I didn't see at the time. But I, I actually seen a bit of dust or a bit of something because I was on the furring too and on those leathers, right? And you know, we're now close. You know, what I was worried about actually. I was worried about his foot rest going into my wheel. Yes, I. You know, because I'm an engineer, don't forget. Yeah. So Metal, stick, bang, wheel, yeah. woof. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be that smart to work that out. Yeah, I'm not that smart and I've worked it out today. <laughs> so that's what I was worried about. So I'm right up here now, right, just stroking the furring. She's rubbing the ladders, the front wheel. I thought, no. So I just knocked it off. And then he came right on over the top of me, round the right. I flicked it to the left. Of course, I had another go on the long right, but I wasn't close enough because you've been there. When you lose that bit, you can't get it it's back. It's trying to edge it back in. Yeah, aye. because everyone's on the limit around that right, you know, and uh, <coughs> around the left, I lose the race by half a bike, you know. But but to be honest, sometimes you don't really think of it, but I didn't mind losing a race to Joy. Yes, I wanted to win the race, but he earned it. Yeah. You know, it's different when you, if you win a race and it's your own, or you lose a race and it's your own fault, it's your own fault. But I lost that race because he wrote that wee bit better than me, yeah. you know, and that was it. We had to accept it. So like, like but, Chris, you were saying, did he, did he, at that exact point, you've crossed the line, if, if you've literally rubbed up against his levers, was there a okay, case, what, what, what happened at that exact point? What, well, what did Joey say? Right. There was no problem. So we're down, we're getting on the rostrum, Right. Didn't Joey's wife see the big black rubber mark down his ladders? And she goes, McCallum, what the hell have you done? Have you tried to kill Joey? <laughs> this is Rostrum, we're all trying to be nice. And Linda's going mad about this big black line down Joey's ladders. Oh. Afterwards, we've seen the fun of it, but at the time, it was. What, what was just Joey just standing there going, You're going to get it from the wife in a second. Here we go. That, I don't have to say it now. He probably just forgot about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you and me, you, we've had big slides, haven't we? Massive stuff. And to be honest, you forgot about it. Yeah. It's only a day later when you remember it. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. You know we talk about, you know, that, you know, one. It took me years later to really remember that 
uh, Cookstown crash properly. Yeah. You know, because the next day you're on to the next race. You know, you're getting ready before you finished like this week's race and you're getting ready for next week's racing. Yeah. And plus if you win as well, it, it <coughs> you've kind of got away with it. And yeah. It, it, the euphoria at the moment. Yeah, what, just... whatever's happened in the race, it's kind of irrelevant afterwards, isn't it? Yeah, I've got another one of them I just remembered there about. So I'm at the Macau Grand Prix and I'm riding <laughs> Joe Miller's 500 Yamaha, right? Just, you know, people don't believe how you forget things, but even people who's obsessed with their work realise they're on to the next quotation and they forgot about the last one until, you know, someone reminds them, look, you lost the last one. Well, that didn't matter because I'm on with the next one. You know, your class, you've pissed up the wrong question, but you're so focused on the next one, you forgot about it. But the wee kid remembered, you know. So anyway, Mackay Grand Prix, I'm a Joe Miller's 500 Yamaha, and I promised Joe I would win for him, you know. And uh, really, I'd make an excuses to myself when I started doing the Mackay Grand Prix in 1989. I've done about 10 of them, you know. I've only had one or two wins, second places, third places stuff, but I should have won more. But anyway, in the first years, I was on RC 30s and stuff when other people like Kevin Swans was on a 500 Yamaha and other people were on rock Yamahas or factories. So that was my excuse there winning because they're in them. I'm in these. So anyway, then I get a 500 Grand Prix by Joe Miller's. And uh, so I'm coming round. Uh, uh, Ryan had come anyway, and I'm, I'm focused, as you see from the pictures, you know, get it right, get it right, get the corners right, get the antlers, get the apex, get the act, get it right, get it right, get it right. And I came round up by the hairpin and I slid off, right? The whole thing went sliding right up the road. That was okay. And uh, down it goes, the bike slides on the buyers, and I pick it up, right? Pick it up, get on the bike, and I start again. I'm going right back to the pits. But I was so focused on the track, didn't I forget to come into the pits? Right, so I'm on this bike and uh, we're going around Macau Grand Prix. I'm watching the times because I wanted to be pole position, you know. So I get a few more laps. I'm watching the time. It's coming down. It's coming down. I'm almost there, and I knew I made a few mistakes. So I'm going again. So I get pole position, and I pull into the garage, put the bike in. The other day, I don't know if you've ever been to Macau. The bike's sitting against the wall, you know. Parked the bike in. It was the right hand side. I parked it against the right hand wall, you know. And we're sitting over for a debrief. You know, we're going now, right, Philip? You don't. And when I come in, you know, I debrief. You know, back and then, right? This wasn't right. Your focus. This wasn't right. The gear lever needs moved. The brake lever needs tightened. We need a wee bit more rebound. We need a bit more preload. A bit more compression. Dump. I'll be happy. So <clears throat> while I'm talking away, didn't and I can't remember if it was Joe or whatever, they over and lifted the bike. They lifted the bike off to move it back into the middle of the garage, you know. And all you hear is, what the hell happened that? And the whole side's torn out of the bike, you know. And I goes, oh, jeez, I forgot about that. <laughs> the deep, the preload's a bit off, but uh, yeah, you've got to rebuild this bike, no? Yeah. But, Jesus. I forgot the old fern and all was all scuffed down the right-hand side and the foot peg shortened a little bit. In the hand. <laughs> Did, <laughs> but... You're focused. Did you, have, <laughs> did you have a good time over in Macau? Like, have, what's your record over there? I think it's only one win. Maybe two, I'd need to check. Uh, not only to, that's but, still out. Macau's a hell, a hell of a place. Yeah. Like. Did you enjoy racing over there? Ah, yes. It's like it, a concrete it, jungle, in it? Yeah, it was uh, It was easy. Uh, not it was easy. Look, you know, if you're focusing on what you're doing, and I go back to if you're controlling your bike, and, you know, it's like, you know, you're using all the road. Well, you know, if you're using that and you control you're using it there's not a problem mm -hmm. but it's you know if you're using that and you're not in control using it then there is a problem mm -hmm. you know so I thought I was in control do you know uh, earlier in the interview you said something about um, like limiting the risk because if you just keep it, uh, road racing is very risky and if you just yeah. keep doing it it's kind of like a numbers game something right. will eventually <laughs> like, go wrong statistically yeah you, you something will eventually happen <laughs> when it came to when it came to retiring in did you say about 99 wasn't it yeah, 99 2000 yeah. um, was it was it kind of inspired by a, an injury or did you know you did you know like you'd had enough and you kind of walked away happy or what was right i liked your word it was a statistic right so really i'm not sure if i said to you earlier or somebody else that uh you know i wanted to win five tts and finish racing because by this time i'd won five northwest to won five ulsters and it was just this five figure to win five tts in a week is the ultimate isn't it mm -hmm. that's it so that meant you know i'm the king of the northwest i'm the king of the ulster i'm now the king of the tt <laughs> even joy or hizzy or hill would have won five in a week you know and um so what happened really 
So that was 96. I won four TTs then. It should have been five. I got to watch get mixed up sometimes, but a couple of them were 250 faults that went wrong. You know, I had a big 250 crash at the TT in Quarry Bends. So I won, I won four TTs in 96. And then I went back in 97. I should have won five, right? I went back in 97 to win five. I had everything together to do that but I'm in 97 I was in some form you know but I slid off my 250 on the Monday quarry bends what a crash that's fast that's, that's fast. so so fast to yourself yeah. uh, I got some beating I got a big you know the right hander going into it quarry bends in there you, you came off there yeah so what happens there do you knock your bike a little bit going into the right down the straight knock yep. it round the right and you pull her over mm. you don't let it drift too much to the left you pull it over to the right and then you throw it into the left yeah well Joe I'd never want I've never won a 250 TT just there's been stupid reasons why I haven't you know one time I buffed the pipes right off Paget's bike when I should have won it you know a couple of times running a patrol I should have won it so anyway I'm going to win 97 I'm going to win everything it's not a problem here the 250 race so we had that all worked out and um Usually I would just borrow someone else in Honda's 250 for that. Yeah. But I made such a fuss that Honda gave me my own 250 for 97, <laughs> right? You know, because I'm going to win everything. And uh, Were you literally that, you know, you know when you're saying this now, were you literally getting on the boat just going, I'm, there was just no other thing but winning? Was no. it literally that confident? It was just... Nothing but winning. That confident? Yeah. I'd love that confidence. You, do, you don't come across as someone that uh, struggles with self uh, with the self confidence. You know what I mean? I would I would love that. I would love to be able to like you know just sit there and just kind of, you know what? Well, that's that's fantastic. Actually, really. we won't go into that in this here podcast because because it all could be repeated. But I'm into psychology big time. Mm. You know, and sports psychology. So was this prior to your racing? It, when my racing started. You know, you got into sports. Yeah, I, I, I study like we're talking about doing it right. So really, in racing, it's like everything, right? There's, there's three things. There's you, you know, on the bike. There's the there's physical, there's mental, and there's mechanical. Okay, there's three objects here. Now, so physically, if you're fit, okay, that's an advantage. Mentally, if you're fit, that's another hell. That's the biggest advantage. Massively, yeah. And mechanically, if your bike's right. So I worked, so I wasn't just a, a crazy road racer doing this stuff. I worked all these stats out the best I could. So I believed, you know, in my head ass stuff, I was as physically fit as I could be. And so to get me mentally, you know, you see, the trouble was back in my day, we had to read this from books. You boys now look it up on the internet and learn all about it. So I had to get that from books out of the library. You know, you get books or buy books and, uh, so I, I got a lot into sports psychology and uh, we had a, a famous sports psychologist in Dublin who uh, he worked with one of the, the big boxers. I'm not going into his name and all nice stuff anyway, but, uh, you know, uh, when Steve, uh, Steve, Chris Eubank was beat by a guy called Steve Collins. Chris Eubank was a famous boxer. Well, an Irish man called Steve Collins beat him. Right, and he was the claim for that victory when he shouldn't have had was it was sports psychology got him up and got him going, you know, and that was it. So I read a lot of this stuff, and then I used to go to sports psychology clinics, right? Just to, to, you weren't sure why you believed, but you listened to them. You know, it's like you boys now. You take advice, you take five pizza pieces of advice, and you get the one that suits you, and that's what you use, and that's it. If it doesn't work, it's your fault. You picked the wrong one, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, I went to sports uh, clinic, sport, and uh, one day in particular, I was there and we talked about, I used to do a lot of training, but I'd never run faster than a seven minute mile. That's not bad, seven minute miles. You know, we used to run like in them days, as part of our training throughout the week, we'd run uh, about three times a week and we'd have done uh, an hour of running. We'd have done seven or eight miles, seven and a half or eight miles in the hour. So you're running eight minute miles or seven and a half. You know, that's pretty good, isn't it? And <clears throat> But I'd never really run much faster than a seven minute mile. We bit not much. So that day in the sports clinic, you know, they taught me how to focus and how to run a six minute mile, you know, or six and a half, can't remember, whatever it was. So I left the sports clinic, the psychology clinic. I went to the gym, poured it down, got on the treadmill, six and a half minute mile, you know. All I had to do was focus. 
Fantastic. Now, now you have to be fit in the first place. Uh, you know, a novice is not going to, you know, if, if you're running 10 minute miles, you're not going to be able to matter how much psychology is in the thing. You're not going to run a six and a half, are you? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's if you're... edges, it's them little bits, isn't it? Yeah, but if you're running sevens all the time, seven and a half, sevens, you know, 655s, yeah. you're pretty fit, you know. So when you do that, then that really convinces you that you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can win. There's not a problem here. So there's not, you know. And you were saying, so like when you get, um, what, was it an injury or did you? Oh, yeah. We, we've lost your whole point. <laughs> sorry, 9 to 9. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that was great. No, yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> we keep drifting, boys. You know, no, no, that's, what, that's, that's what the pod's all about. It's about. People's going, where the hell are these? You know, I just don't remember things. When I'm talking to you, I remember things. So that's why yeah. I'm sharing mm. it with you. Um. So, yeah, so what happened anyway? So, 96, I won my four TTs. It should have been five. I think that one, something happened to 250. 97, I'm going to win again, five TTs. Formula One, no problem. 250, I slid off. So, Joey and I was racing the 250 race. You know, he's a big opposition. And uh, we had it all worked out. So, I was using two soft rear tires. Mostly on a 250, you don't change the tire. You just run it the whole way. But... I was had this new plan. I was using instead of a medium rear tire, I would use a soft, and we'd run it for two laps. So for the last two laps, if I needed the last lap, and we had to go away and beyond the call of duty, I could do it, and I'd have the grip to do it. Yeah, that was the plan. So what happened was we soft tire, and we come in. we Joey and I is about equal. Did it, did it, no problem. I'm now feeling good. I'm riding good, and I'm feeling good that in my mind I've got this secret for the last lap, if need be. So there's no problem here. Yeah. I'm going to win it. And uh, we done when we done the wheel change in the 250, single-sided swinging arm, so it shouldn't have been a problem. Somebody dropped the nut. Oh. So we had to get the nut back, get the stuff done, get the wheel on. And I lost about 12 seconds. Which is huge in this game. Which is huge in this game. Right. Fuck this. So I, get, I knew I'd lost time. I got to Glen Helen, and I think I was minus 12. Something like that. God, fuck. There's a lot to do. But what I should have done was I should have just, I had two laps, Liam. Lap and three quarters left. Lap. I should have, like, took it easy. But I didn't. This stupid red flag came down and I rode that bike like I've never rode it before in my life. You know? And so I got that signal at minus 12. And I come over, I remember Ray and Colin, you know, Ray and Colin. I come over there, I threw the bike flat on the side like I've never done it before. And the people there are seeing it, it's drifting, right, on that downward thing. This 250 is sliding both wheels on the right-hander. I pick it up, still holding it flat around the left, right down the wall, you know, right down there. And I've never rode as fast in my life through there, loving it because I'm focused, I'm doing this right. And um, so I come to Quarry Bends, <coughs> and I remember I got a signal just before that. I got another signal. I think it was minus seven. You closed right. the gap, yeah. That was to pull, I can't remember, we're going to say that three, four, five seconds. So to pull that in that short distance <laughs> is unreal. You're huffing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are you know, absolutely huffing, yeah. I'm on it. So now I'm gone, and, you know, it's not a problem. I should have eased off, you know, but anyway, I came to Quarry Bands. And uh, so Quarry Bands, as you know, you come down there, you knock it off, you go around the right, get a wee blast in the middle, and then around the left. Well, uh, but you're only using half the road. So I've gone, well, like, let's hold it flat through this. We'll go flat through the right. Instead of accelerating in the middle, we'll break in the middle to get it around the left. You know, let's carry the corner speed through yep. here. That's how you get time up, isn't it? Well, when I came round the right flat, I mean, never lifted it. Never lifted it. It's held again the stop. Not we silly roll offs. You know, there's people who hold it flat, as you know, but they don't hold it flat. They roll it off. That's not flat. Right? Flat is flat. And, uh, <laughs> stretch the cables. Yeah, it's yeah. Flat stretch the cable. Yeah. She's flat. <laughs> and when I got round the left, it was windy, right? And the bike was right over in a side. But when you look at it, you see when you cross over that white line up a bit, the camber on the road falls away. Right, and the minute I got in there and the wind was under the bike and the camber and the road fell away, I just lost the front. Jesus, that's fast. 150 mile an hour about. Well, I think um, one of our patrons was asking about that because I think that would have been a lap record if... Ah, uh, 
and the like, rest. Yeah. That would have been unreal, right? So I got through there in the front wheels turning. Now I think I'm doing. I'm going to hold it, don't I? So <laughs> you've got no other option, mate. You are, you've got to try and do something. Don't you? you know, yeah. you've been there. You've got it. So this front wheel's turning, and I'm keeping turning it, right? Because I still think I'm going to hold this. You know, like you see people doing. What do you call that lad who like, does now? Mark is. Mark is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Marcus on the roads, you know, and because I have saved a few of them, you know, backs and fronts. But this it keep on turning. It kept on turning, and I knew when it kept on turning, I'm down. And you can go back, the pictures are on the road, so they are. The line is thin, and it gets thicker and thicker, oh. you know, as the thing turns. So I'm going, fuck this, I'm off this time, you know. So, <laughs> But as you know, you're actually, you're working this out. You, your brain, because we're used working at this 200 mile an hour, your brain, you're trying to work out what to do, right, because we're gone, but... We're in a road race, you know, it's not too bad on the track. You're fired up the gravel. The chances you hit the armco is very slim. And if there is armco there, there'll be an airbag in front of it. It's not really gotten roads. So you've got to, when you slide off on a road, you've got to work out right away where I'm going, what I'm going to hit, and what you can do about it. So I'm sliding up a road thinking, fuck this. Keep the arms I'm, in, keep the arms in. Yeah. yeah. So down I went, and lucky, lucky. It went to the side. And I slid off sideways, but I started to toss and turn, you know, <clears throat> and he, the blue lines was all there. So the bike was right up the road, right up the road. And, you know, the left, there's the rocks right in front of you there. Well, yeah. that's where the bike ended up. That's where the bike ended up against those rocks there. And we've lost it on the right. And I ended up there as well. You know, but I tossed, I went up the footpath and there's a big blue line on the edge of the curb where it cut right through the back of my leathers and cut through my leg. There, I've still got the scar on the leg. That was the footpath going up the, the curb. And then I go right along the footpath, right along the grass, off the footpath, back onto the road and then nearly up where the bike is. And while without, I'm, without, you, without you actually hitting the wall, the yeah. place, that is some distance. That is a tremendous distance. And if yeah. you just... Could have been really lucky. So, uh, and I, so I was watching, and I sort of knew I was all right, right? Because as when I was tossing over, I'm looking everywhere to see what I'm going to hit, and I knew I wasn't going to hit anything. Mm. So even though I'm sliding up the road, I'm working out. I'm I'm pretty good. I'm not going to hit anything here, you know. Like Quarry Benz, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't, I could no, at no point ever while I go through Quarry Benz, going, I've lost the front gun. Yeah, I'd be all right, no. And. Uh, and I could hear Jesus. while I was this is the truth and the people there will tell you at this crash while I was going up I could hear ah! I could I could hear you know the people because this is people the, taking a deep breath yeah because you're a goner you know so I get up I remember then I get up I'm a bit wobbly you can imagine when I get up you know I stand up I check when you're on the ground first but no what you actually think is I knew there's more bikes coming I better get off this road you know just in case so <laughs> you get up you, everything's working and I start to walk back and then you could hear the crowd all cheering and clapping, you know. So Jesus. then I walk back, uh, I get to, I walk back and then I'm going, right, I need to get back to the pits now, you know, for the next race. I need to, so I got to, I think a marshal or some of the TV crew or something, you know, put me in a car and brought me back around the back of the course to stuff. And uh, But what happened then, you see, that's bad news. When the notice comes back to the pits that, you know, you're off at Quarry Bends, it's... Yeah. Uh, there's, there's certain parts in road races where you hear a particular bit with a crash and you just... You know. You don't... You, uh, well, you, you, yeah. I can't remember whether I had the phone mobile with me or I borrowed a phone, but I phoned the girlfriend, new girlfriend by this time, right? <laughs> And uh, I says, look, I've crashed, but I'm all right. See you soon. You know, so then I got a lift back. So they're trying to be in the pits and people are trying to say to her, well, look, your boyfriend has slid off at Quarry Bands. We have no news. But, you know, she said, it's OK. I was speaking to him. <laughs> so Just as calm as that. Like, yeah, so, so very, very lucky that way, you know. But anyway, so I lost that race. And then I lost that race. And that, I was I was beat bad. I was beat up bad. This arm actually wouldn't move. You know, it was right down. It was like beat to death. And the ladders ripped to bits. I've still got them. I mean, ripped to bits proper. So then on Wednesday's race, it screwed me up a bit. It was a 600 Super Sport race. And uh, I was in so much pain when I started the first of all, then you have to go through a medical mm -hmm. after that to get fit. But 
and you had to do your press ups and all to prove your arms and all work. But lucky I was strong enough that I could do press ups in one arm, even though someone was here, it wasn't really working. I was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the girlfriend's I, helping you with the collar. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah all right. so no, don't worry about that. You know, and they are pretty strict, as you know, the medical because you're, you know, you're their responsibility if something goes wrong. So I start the 600 race and uh, I, I remember just let the clutch out the line and then really I had to just hang on by this bar the whole way and I managed to stay in second and uh, I think Ian Duffus or, or else uh, maybe it was uh, what do you call the other lot I know him well he's going to kill me for not remembering Ian Simpson I think it was him who won it maybe yeah. but I was with him in the road and I couldn't get away and all he had to do was stay with me and really I was only riding with one arm Yeah, you know so that was again there's my TT fucked up so I'd only one win by an eye and a second place by Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But then I came back on Friday and I won the production and I won the senior, both in the one day. With a bat, like uh, totally battered up and everything. It was, it was hard. It was hard because that was two or three laps for a production race and six for a senior. So you can... Fair play. You and, can, and was this uh, 66? That was, that was 96. 96. No, that was 97. 97, right. That was 97. So I tried, I tried to get my five wins in 96. I tried in 97, didn't get them. Then in 98, I had the best setup of my life. I had a factory RC45. I had the best fire blade you can get. I had the best 600 you can get. So I'm going to the TT to this year, stuff a lot and win five. If it was six, I'd win that too. Yeah. And, uh, but what happened by a couple of weeks before it, I crashed at Thruxton and broke my back. A high sider, you know, the, in about the third gear, right hand or left hand or thrust and mm -hmm. right again, my own fault. Right, I'm pulled. I'm quickest in practice. Pole position for practice. Michelin again, who's my best buddies, give me a hard rear tire. Right, and the rules was, you know, the score. You take us easy for two or three laps. Don't even worry. You know, thrust and boys, it's all in the last two or three laps, isn't mm -hmm. it? So I'm supposed to, this, I hadn't used this tire before until we, I think we only had one or two, so we'd saved it for the race. Yeah. And uh, so Thruxton, I'm in about, in super sport, I was in 96 and 97, I was sort of winning the odd round. You know, by this time I'm into, uh, I done World Thunder Bikes in 95, which, so I can ride circuits if I want to. Just before that, it wasn't financially viable to do it because you could make more money out of roads. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we start the race. Uh, I'm in about second or third place or maybe third or fourth. And I see the gap starting to open a wee bit on the second lap. And I, sh I shouldn't have done it. I thought, right, get wind up. I forgot about the tire. Boy. And around that left hander, I get a third gear high side. Isn't that I, big? I, I, Is that I, I've turned two. Uh, or the one around the back. It's about the th about the left hander. Is there about a third gear left hander there? Yeah. So you uh, turn one, turn two, turn three, and then in the complex. That yes. Left. Whichever one of them it was. Yeah, I think. It's, yeah, I've it. never been back since. Mm. Right. So I go listen to the people about twenty feet in the air, and I land on my arse. Right. I've crashed twice on that corner. Have you? Mm. Isn't it sore? Did you get a high side or like a proper one? Or an um, old, an old low side? I've, I've had a high side there on a 600 and also uh, lap one of a super bike race I once uh, rushed in. The, in uh, obviously, yeah, you're going as fast as you can mm -hmm. and um, somebody like sat up in front and there was <sighs> one of those where, that, like, oh. do you know when it like goes back like dominoes yep. and uh, uh, Danny Buchan was in front of us and he just hit the brakes and, and I was I just had nowhere to go and just ploughed in the back of them and I've um, I've got a picture of my <laughs> my chit and my arm is it was so lucky that it didn't get trapped in the swinging arm because I'm lying oh. on his back tyre my chin I had a big red mark there where it, his back tyre took all the skin off my chin <laughs> and my arm was like uh, where his shock is Whoa. like around so I was like unbelievably lucky imagine there. your arm would have lapped around I, that wheel yeah I try not to think about you're it, but, it yeah. your lavish your lavish would have been ripped oh yeah I would have been. <laughs> well the thing is Thrux, um, <laughs> with an arm going <laughs> Thruxton's so abrasive as well it it, re it just rips leathers open and yeah. did you see Glenn crash there this year he's yes. doing over 100 mile an hour he crashed and he just stopped straight away because yeah. the, the really? tarmac's so abrasive yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy oh it's crazy but, so you that, that sort of screwed up your plan of getting five in 98 in 98 so I'm in the air and land on my back and arse and I broke my back in three places mm -hmm. right Jesus you know I'm fucked you know so then what happened then it's a long long story won't go into the details but uh, V&M had a team of Simpson and Rudder then uh, I Simpson and Rudder for some reason Honda took the bikes off V&M so V&M riders had two riders with no bikes 
and my team, Motorcycle City, had bikes with no riders. So I done a deal with Honda, Dave Hancock and that. Right, we'll use my bikes for them. So Simpson and Rudder ended up riding my 600, my, my 600, my Formula One factory bikes and uh, my Prodi bike. So it worked out good because a bit of a deal with Honda was as long as my bikes won the races, I still got paid my money. My Keeps, prize money. Yeah, happy days. Keep so, the mortgage. So, so it worked out okay. And I sort of managed them bikes for the Northwest and the TT. Mm. So that meant I had no 98. Then at the end of 98, so when we look at the statistics here, I had three attempts and it's not really going to work, is it? So 99, I'll give it one more go to get back again because I still think I'm a winner and I'm good. By this time, I'm working with Motorcycle City. And unfortunately, we won't go into the details, but I had a big fallout with Honda in 98 after that. Yeah. And uh, But lucky I worked with Motorcycle City. I became a general manager there in after sales. But Motorcycle City was Yamaha's biggest customer. And I'd also been very, very good friends with Andy Smith for years. You boys are probably young. You've heard of Andy Smith. Used to be the boss of Yamaha big racing man so we done a deal through motorcycle city and yamaha that i would have yamahas for 99 yeah so i've never been more motivated in my life because honda made falling out i was going to teach them a lesson at the tt wasn't it and by this time anyway the r the r1 was a better bike than the rc45 and then on the fire blade you know they hadn't beat it so i had the best 600 i could get i had a production fire blade and i had like an f or not a production R1 and I had a like a factory R1 with tuned to the neck by my good friend Tony Scott. Now Tony Scott, not the Tony Scott now, you remember the original Tony yeah. Scott who's not dead, who's dead, died now. Mm -hmm. uh, he was my good, good friend. Do you know I'm his biggest customer, Tony mm -hmm. Scott's? He has either rebuilt or tuned over 100 engines for me. Wow. Jesus. And that's the truth. It's in Tony's records. It's all there in black and white and his son can confirm that to you. I am Tony Scott's biggest customer. That's the relationship uh, I had with him. Can I just tell you a, a quick funny story there? Do you know, uh, there's another Tony Scott <laughs> yes. who, who runs a business called T3 Racing and uh, he used to run the Triumph Triple Challenge and uh, Tony actually, I think a lot, I think um, sort of early in his career, made a lot of progress very quickly. He did. Just by having the name of Tony another Scott. famous engine. <laughs> a lot of people just think, because the name Tony Scott's got so much uh, credibility and rep a yeah. great reputation. And other Tony Scott never used to um, correct people. If if they wrongly assumed that he was the other Tony Scott, you yeah. just let them assume it. I would have so thought, like, oh, could he do his name? Yeah, yeah, chucking in the boot, young I mean, how, how, <laughs> how fortunate is that? But yeah. Um, yeah, I think know. it did help his career. I agree with really. I um, changed my name after so this. So you went went on the Yamahas. and So I was on my Yamahas. I had, like, the best R1 you could get built. It was superb, everything. My production bike was superb, everything. I was really going to win big time and knock Honda off the top step. And so we're getting that all ready. And then I went, um, there was a some British meeting on Donington or somewhere, but I went to Tondrigi 100 to ride for the first time my R1, it, just to get that bike right, because that's the F1. That's the bike's going to stuff the Northwest and the TT. And... Um, so I went there, I won a silly, I lost one of the big races, stupid, I, I break myself because the forks was too soft. And then the second big race, I won it, you know, stuff, so there's no problem, this bike's good. On the Sunday, that was Saturday, on Sunday, Saturday night, I flew back to Donington to ride my production bike in the super stock race at Donington to get used to my road R1 for the production stuff. And I slid off it. I, I'm not sure if I was knocked off or slid off, but the guy behind me, I don't know who it was, hit me right on the shoulder blade. And I've still got the ladders with a big black mark down the shoulder blade. And um, what happened was, I remember feeling a lot of pain when he hit it. Well, back in Daytona in 1992, I ripped that shoulder blade right off my back. And I mean right off my back. So it's always been a wee bit weak ever since. And what had happened, we didn't realize afterwards. So when I was hit in the back, I remember the pain. It was sore and all the rest, but so two weeks later it was the Northwest 200 and maybe a week later and I'm going to win. And the very first race of the day at the Northwest, I'm right up there fighting for the, the, the win. The shoulder blade popped off my back. So what had happened, he'd moved my shoulder blade when he'd hit me in the back. And then with the Northwest, the shoulder blade came off my back. <sighs> so I managed, 
you know, good old Fred McSorley, a doctor, helped me with some painkillers and some stuff. I had some seconds and thirds at the Northwest, tough stuff, but that was riding my one arm because this one wasn't working, you know. So then I went to the TT and in the first race there, I nearly had a big off. We managed, what we'd done was we, we'd done crisscross strapping over to hold the shoulder blade and back in place, so which was good. And that felt good all practice. I was taking it easy. But when I upped the pace for the race to get it, uh, the bike was sliding. I couldn't ride the bike. Something was wrong. And uh, what had it wasn't until later. So I I had to pull out of a lot of races that week. I went in the last race, the production race. I got a third, but that's a disgrace compared to going to win. And what had happened really was <laughs> with <laughs> uh, this shoulder joint started to pull apart because the shoulder blade was fixed to my back. This poor shoulder was getting pulled apart and I'd stretched the nerves. So I didn't have any feeling in this hand when I thought I had. So... It was just then, right? So after the TT, this was going to take months and months for nerves, you know, to get better. Mm. So after the TT, sort of, I didn't race the rest that year. I'm making my mind up what to do, you know. But, and I'd watched poor uh, uh, Simon back crashing on the mountain. He was just in front of me. We left the pits. I'll never forget it because I was good friends with Simon back and that. And uh, we were having a bit of banter in the pits. And he said to me, he goes, I fucking know how you won the TT McCann. He was riding Hondas. He had, like, it wasn't my old bike, but it was one of our team bikes. He goes, it was the bike, it wasn't you. And I remember we came out of practice together and uh, or he, him before me and he went and I could see him in the distance during practice. I wasn't making anything, but he was riding. He was riding hard. He wanted to win. And then I came around the 33rd and I seen his skid marks on the 33rd. And so I wasn't, I don't know what, whether, I don't think anyone knows if he lost the back or the front, but he lost around the 33rd on the last part of it. I'm going to say it might have been the front trying to keep on turning or it might have been the back getting the gas on, but the thin line got thicker and uh, poor Simon went off the 33rd. So I stopped, you know, seeing the line and I could see Simon away down there. And that sort of, you know, it sort of thought after I thought, do I need to be doing this anymore? And I thought the statistics, which you add them all up, I'm not supposed to win five TTs in a week. I've tried in 96, I've tried in 97, I've tried in 98, I'm now trying in 99. You're not supposed to win these. If you haven't got them by now, you're not supposed to. So that was it then, you just stopped. And were you quite, quite happy and sort of satisfied with what you'd done in your career? You, you didn't, like you were just happy to close that book and sort of open a new one? And yeah, I was, that was it. I was ready for stopping, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I wasn't, I didn't enjoy that last two years because of injuries. Yeah. So I wasn't having the fun out of it. I had pain out of it. I hadn't achieved what I wanted to achieve. So why are you keeping going? Mm. You're like, we're now flogging a dead horse. Yeah. Well, if you're not enjoying you know? it, that's the thing. Because achievement, like yeah. winning one TT is a, a massive yeah. achievement. Never mind all them that all of them yeah. you've won. You know what I mean? So Yeah, so it was just give up. But I mean, it was not, it was hard because you, you still think you're a winner. I was getting lots of offers to ride bikes and stuff, but just said, no, I'm stopping. And that's why, again, so many people get hurt or end up in fatalities. They go on longer than they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't keep this going for, by this time I've been racing for about 17 years. So I've done well. You've done a good stint. And I've it's had good. a good stint. It's I good to get it. in, have and a good time and get, get out. out. Think, yeah. Get out. And now I'm still here talking to you young boys today. Fantastic. Um, now, now uh, there'll be so many people listening to this podcast that uh, are, are really interested in you, your past and all those stories, as well, but will be equally interested in the future and what you're kind of up to these well, days. And like, your boys, job. do you know we've had a couple of beers here and a thing? <laughs> Can I take a little break for 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah crack on, yeah, crack yeah, no on. <laughs> Click, buy, deliver with remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Race In. As you can tell, we're all back from the toilet break here. So where, where were we, Chrissy? Where yeah, were we? well, so far we've, we've obviously talked and really enjoyed your stories about your career, uh, but I'm sure a lot of people will be tuning in, really interested in uh, what your thoughts on the future. And obviously people will be very familiar with seeing you on TV at the Northwest and sort of your involvement, Northwest and Ulster. Um, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm pinching one of, the, one of the questions from the patrons, but um, someone asked uh, where you sort of see the, the national road racing in, in the next like sort of 
10 years. Um, am I right in saying it's, <coughs> it's quite... So there's lots of different clubs and it's the, it's, they don't exactly work together, like North and South. And where do you sort of see the, the, the well, national scene? I think it's a bit of common sense needed to start off with you know it's like in the past as you know the Ulster Grand Prix uh, the, the club and the people that run the Ulster Grand Prix were sort of seen as opposition to the North West you know and they didn't see eye to eye and they didn't work together and that sort of thing but the first thing we've got to do now and we are doing is working together the North West 200 and the Ulster Grand Prix are working together Crazy. you know and maybe even we're trying there's lots of stuff going to happen this year we're maybe trying to to put a prize fund together that you could have an overall overall winner from both of them you know there could be an yeah, extra, a championship yeah kind of like a championship it. yeah that maybe there could be a, a i don't know the figure maybe a five or a ten thousand pound uh for the overall superbike winner or the over, overall production winner or the overall super sport winner I don't know yet, but that's all the ideas that are rumbling around to make it worth your while competing in both of them. Sp speaking as a competitor at these events, the bigger the prize pot, the better, I say, massively. <laughs> well, and being a racer yourself, <laughs> you, I know you, that, you you'll know. be exactly on our side of that side of things. Yeah, <laughs> so the, the thing we're working on there is getting better prize money. Good. You know, I as a racer know we need it. You know, from the outside, people all think racers are rich and they've got lots of money and there's no problem. That's not the case. Yeah. We all need every penny we can. So what I'm trying to do with all this, with sponsorship money, with everything, is generate more money for prize money and more money to help the teams come because it costs money to bring your team there. Uh, like, I, I totally agree with that fact. And it's like the, the good thing about the prize fund element of it is the fact that it is an equal playing field. Yeah. That, that's what I believe. When you see a prize pot, it's a bit like that. That is black and white. Look, son, if you finish 20th, 10th or 1st, that, that's there. But I yeah. think it's always like, you know, that starting fee thing. It's like you always need the competitors to be competing. That's how yeah. it is. And it's a bit like if that, oh, you just money, money, money. The, yeah. the game, This game works on money. And it's a bit like even the privateers need that that help yeah. that support to get yeah. to that event. Can I, can I just ask, and, uh, for example, when the, the North West runs every year and it's it's easy for us as passionate race fans to to try and explain what the effect is, but, you know, ha the, the forced closure from, like, the COVID years, like, say, at the TT last year, people can actually see for themselves what a massive um, loss loss and all of all of the small businesses and you know it's it's one of those things you know if you're spending money in someone's pub and then they've got loads of money and they're spending it in like the groceries and then there's the groceries happy and he's spending his money in the india and every, yeah. everyone's getting wealthier it's sort of a math there's a massive turnover um but like you say like the northwest like you can see it on the tv the huge yeah. crowds hotels are packed um, and for for those you know week or so, it's um, it's massive. The yeah, and not only that, when you get a good experience there, and you go home and tell your family what a good experience you have, there's a possibility they'll come for holidays. I was just about to say, at where where like, I know this area just off the TV and stuff. It's the first time I've been here, and what a beautiful! <laughs> we we uh, we did a few laps of the TT course earlier, and um, you mean the lot... Northwest course, not the, the TT sorry, course. Yeah, yeah, the it's been a busy course. day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah don't forget, true. you're in the, Ireland. You're yeah, not in the Isle of Man. We did a few. <laughs> we did a few laps of the Triangle, and uh, oh yeah, and like the course road. And, I mean, the sea was rough, but it was so so beautiful. And um, yeah, like you say, why wouldn't you want to come here? Of, uh, I just quick the check check the Patreon questions there. One quick Patreon question for you so if Keith Fletcher asked uh, you over your racing career your three most fierce rivals oh in every race you know everyone was a rival should it have been a <laughs> national yeah. or not uh, you know you know Joey Dunlop we can't say fierce because he just was pure talent and skill you know he was a tough, tough guy there. You know, Hezzy was a tough, tough road racer. Foggy is just, everyone knows what Foggy's like. You know, Foggy showed no mercy on no one. You know, but so I was lucky to be teammates with those boys and, and learn about them and how they thought. But, you know, really, and then it was when I'd done uh, Super Sports 600. You know, I'd done Thunderbike World Series in 95 and then I'd done British stuff in 96, 97. There was some hard track racers there too, really. So it would be un unfair to pick one in, in, in particular, but there's been tough, t really every, should it be a super a BSB, super sport race or a TT, there was 10 people there to win. 
and they weren't very, they weren't easy. Very diplomatic. <laughs> ah, like very, way well swerved. Very well, well swerved. A huge thank you for for taking mm. the time and uh, coming and meeting us and uh, coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you. Uh, yeah, coming up and uh, very nice to meet you. No, no problem. Just uh, there is one good when you talk. When I was just thinking of that picture, the white shirt boy. You know, uh, Wetham. Wetham was a tough guy. He was a tough racer. We had one. Uh, Super Sports 600 race at the Ulster Grand Prix when we're talking about it and uh, there was myself, him and Dave Leach. They were on two Jurak Suzuki's and uh, I was on my Honda. Brand Reed won it on his Yamaha but that was a tough, tough race where there was like, you know, I had there was red fern marks on their blue and white Suzuki's and there was white and blue marks on my red Honda. It was like, so wet him. He was a tough one. Good lad. Well. He'd be yeah. over the moon listening to this now, going, yeah. oh, I got it in there, well, champion. He knows he was a tough one, you know. Good lad. But also, I, have, uh, I must give him a quick shout out because I got your number from him to get in contact. Uh, Craig Watson from Kawasaki. Ah, yes. Captain and he, Kawasaki. He said, Craig said to me that he's been practicing the last, the COVID years, he's been practicing on track on his LX10. So for the next uh, Kawasaki bike launch, he reckons he's going to sh- he's gonna show you the way around. That's just come from him, though. Well, Craig will be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sharpening up my skills as well, Craig. <laughs> ah, well, massive, massive thank you to our sponsors, Colchester Kawasaki, and to our patrons. And uh, look forward to catching up with you sometime soon. Boys, thanks a lot. See you on the coast. Yeah, thanks. 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 <laughs> Brilliant. Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two time motorcycle news dealer of the year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing.